slash M-E-N. What's up, guys? And uh, this is Shin Megumi Tensei Network, uh, episode 177. I have my host here, Spencer. What's up, Spencer? Hello, fellow host, uh, Kuro. I am uh, now being your replacement for the Café LeBlanc podcast. This is episode 5. If 177 was a little too intimidating for everybody, you can also think of this as the fifth episode in your podcast. So we're doing a... <laughs> We're doing a friendly little crossover. I was just thinking for this, because you kind of have a, as someone with a very wordy podcast name, I always refer to it as just like SMTN. What do you, like, do you have like a shortened, abbreviated version for uh, your Cafe LeBlanc podcast? You know what? It, when I was doing the logo, I was I was doing the just that. So my logo is LBP, but I never refer to it as LBP. Like, even when I'm talking to people about it, I'm like, it's Cafe LeBlanc podcast, but like... My actual logo is just LBP, so I never used it, but it's there. I mean, I'm just saying you'd get a lot of little big planet listeners, so the SEO, <laughs> the SEO would be ripe for you there. You'd be, you'd be oh, just man. soaking in all the lonely, lonely little big planet fans like myself. Oh man, you know what's really funny? I never been able to get into that series, and that that series came out like when I was supposed to get into it, you know, when the a, a, a inspiration and everything, and I was just never able to. To me, it was just like Mario ripoff, and it, it's really not. It's really not at all. But that was like my first impression on that. Well, well, Kuro, if someone is listening to this for the first time, their first impression of you, if they don't know what your podcast is, is that we now know that you hate Little Big Planet. So for anyone <laughs> out there listening, uh, who are you, and and what are you what are you doing on this podcast? Well, I have no idea what I'm doing in this podcast, but uh, <laughs> I have a Persona channel. It's the maintenance channel. Um, I just talk about Persona and Shin Megami Tensei and RPGs and that stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff. I love talking about games, so that's my stuff. So I guess that's what I'm doing here, right? Exactly. Talking about games. And then, and then because you also have a podcast, we're going to just put it up t- twice in one day because really why – why make why make two separate products when you can just do one and cover both bases? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So this was really 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 funny how this even came about because I wanted to talk about The Last of Us and you wanted to talk about the other games and I was like, yeah, this is literally the perfect time to talk about all the games that have been out so far. Yeah, and it's really unfortunate because I have zero friends, at least that I'm aware of, that have played and beaten both Last of Us Part Two and Persona 5 Royal, which are like kind of like tied right now in terms of like average uh, review rankings online uh, for Game of the Year. And it's just like, it's so funny to me like comparing the two of those just because I, I feel like it's so, so different. But at the same time, like because of that, I kind of really want to like talk about like game of the year check-in so far also i cannot believe it's almost july like we're literally recording this on (laughs) june 30 like we're we're finally over the halfway point it's just like it's kind of weird because like we were talking about before the show starts i feel like everything i was super oh my god hype like freaking out about has already kind of released that i'm personally excited for like i'm still looking forward to other stuff when we're going to talk about it but it, it is kind of funny like I don't. I can't think of another year besides 2020 that had like so many big titles within the first six months. Yeah, yeah, it, it was really interesting because I think it was whatever we had planned. They had already planned. They like either moved it or just we haven't heard about it anymore. Mm-hmm. And but the first six months were really packed with games. I, I want to say like there was a lot of good games that came out of the first part. And uh, even games like Persona or Resident Evil, which I don't know if you played or not, oh, yeah. but they they came out right at the beginning of of the uh, pandemic. They came out at the perfect time. Like I can't I can't imagine a better time for a game to come out like right right before that, uh, so that people can actually game and not have to work or whatever. Even though I have to work myself, but um, 
it was it just came out at a perfect time and then and then it's just been kind of radio silent ever since yeah so i i guess really in terms of it i'm gonna go down uh i have like the pulled up list of everything kind of released from 2020 and bring up anything that kind of seems either like a notable release or whether you have any of opinion on it uh are you much into monster hunter at all perchance because i have not touched any bit of world but i know that's like one that like tons and tons and tons of people played because iceborne finally came out on pc this year oh yeah it did it did, it did. um i actually played iceborne last year on the ps4 and uh i just i quit i was I... <laughs> <laughs> no no it's, it's not a bad expansion at all it's good it's really good the problem with monster hunter is the same problem that i have with like 99 percent of the of the rpgs i don't have enough time to to keep playing mmos maintain the channel play other games you know like so it's it's so time consuming and sometimes i don't know if like the the reward is there for for that i don't know so unfortunately you've just fallen into my trap now some people listening to this may be wondering why did spencer bring up a game that released last year is the first game of 2020 and that was a test and unfortunately you failed it because on this channel we have a hard rule of never calling monster hunter an rpg because in my brain i just cannot look at monster Hunter and be like this is an rpg it's just like it's one of those things <laughs> that like it, it just like boggles my mind how like people kind of associate the two like on on its surface i totally get it i totally like see because of the systems and everything else for it but it's just this weird thing for me that i've never been able to get over of like never once while playing that game i thought this is an rpg it just always <laughs> felt like like just because for me like those hunting games like tokiden or like uh soul sacrifice or freedom wars mm -hmm. or monster Hunter, like they all just kind of seem like their own genre to me yeah, I think I think you're right. And I, I saw a discussion on another channel that was regarding um on another channel on another um Facebook group or whatever and they had they were talking exactly about that um that on Dark Souls cuz you know Dark Souls kind of it's an RPG in in at its core is it has RPG aspects to it, but it kind of went its own way and it became its own thing now people call it the dark souls of whatever you yeah, know like, like, so, like yeah I, like <laughs> same thing with uh like any of the from games or whatever like even if it is not a from software game people will instead of referring it as an rpg usually just call it like a sort a souls born like yeah exactly so is, is that is so crazy to me now that you mentioned that like that is pretty much what's going to happen at some point with monster hunter it uh, somebody else is going to make a game like that because this that game sold really well for capcom uh, which is funny because it was it's always been like it's no own niche thing like Monster Hunter has been out for years now mm -hmm. and nobody played those games and uh, Monster Hunter World came out and a lot of people was playing those games I was in Japan when that game came out and the promos for that game was insane they had big statues of the dragons like just there I was like that is so cool so speaking of Japan, because this is a very uh, prominent segue, would you believe it if I told you over six months ago, Yakuza 7 came out in Japan? I know about it, but uh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't seen the impact on, on the game in the West. It's so, it's so weird. Like It's just like Persona. When it kind of oh, no. just no, at least with this one we got it announced like at least it was announced like back when it was announced in Japan. So like I I don't I have I've been pretty fine with like the I mean actually I will say we've actually gotten quite a lot of English footage now especially after it was shown off yeah. a couple of weeks ago. But no, it, yeah, it, it's one of those things that's uh this one's kind of a weird one because it falls into both camps and same thing is gonna happen with Scramble of like mm -hmm. it's already out so like the impressions are there if you want to look for it but not a lot of yeah. the Western fans really have. Like, from everything I've seen of Yakuza 7, like, I was so impressed by, like, the little bit I played. Because I downloaded the demo uh, yeah. at the beginning of January. And I was so impressed by it all, it, like, motivated me to pick up all the remaining Yakuza games I was missing on PS4. So that I can hopefully get caught up by the time it releases this holiday. But, yeah, it, it's, so, it's so weird to me that, like, that transition to, like, an RPG system worked so well. And, like, for the most part, at least in terms of the japanese fans and critics have been universally approved that's good i actually never played a yakuza game and all people have been telling me to and i've been i will i will play i'll, pick I'll, up I'll seven. say though like because seven, uh, seven is basically a clean cut there are ties to the original game but you can just start mm -hmm. with seven yeah that, that's what i heard that's what I'm, that's what my plan is that, that yeah i have it on the back of my head i'm like i'm gonna get that game when it comes out because it, it looks good they, the series have attracted me for a while but uh 
you know, there's so many games to play. I finally clear my backlog. Yeah, I literally just finished my backlog. I have, like, one more game to play, and that's Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Oh, you know, only, like, another 120-hour game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's that's pretty much all I have left on my backlog. Uh, I'm pretty happy about it. I may just pick up the other Yakuza games at some point, but no, pro- no rushing those. I'm, no. I'm, I'm good. Um, let me see. So, besides getting into the obvious big one for me, at least, uh, I didn't play this. Did you play Dragon Ball Z Kakarot at all? You know what? Um, I didn't. I was going to, because I am a Dragon Ball Z fan. I love Dragon Ball. But, uh, Tokyo Mirage Stations was coming out, and I yeah, just... Yeah, it was the I, same I, day they released. Yeah, so I was like, you know what? I could play Tokyo Mirage Stations again, or I could play, um, Dragon Ball. And I just went for Tokyo Mirage Sessions. And I honestly, like, the game looks good, uh, Dragon Ball Z, but it just doesn't really attract me enough. As The premise of it sounds really good, though. Uh, an RPG... Yeah, like, I, lo- I love sounds... CyberConnect, like, and I loved the... Like, because this is from the Naruto Storm team. Like, mm-hmm. like, everything on it, like, ticks my right box, but for whatever reason, I don't know if I finally hit that point in Dragon Ball game burnout or just because I know how long it is. I'm just like... That'll be, like, a really good game, like, if I can, like, pick it up for, like, 20 bucks and have, like, nothing to do for a month. But just because it's, like, if I had to, like, really pick in terms of, like, yeah, like, what I was playing, like, I have experienced the story of Dragon Ball in so many different games and mediums. It's just, like, I'd rather just play Token Mirage Sessions. You, you're not, uh, that's just, that's the thing for me. It's, like, it's almost like a burnout, but I can always see it again. I, I would love to, you know, like, play it and everything. But, again, like you said, I need a month and I'm completely free to play it. I don't want to pay $60 for the game. Mm-hmm. So I guess then going on to uh, the first big one, at least for me so far, was uh, Tokyo Mirage Sessions Sharp FE Encore, almost the longest name game of the year. What did you think <laughs> uh, playing it earlier? So was this your first time trying the game, or did you play it on the Wii U? Oh, no, no, I played it on the Wii U. So I, I, went, I went in knowing what I was getting into on, like, the first time that, that I played that game. Um, so I think I had a better experience this time around with the game. Obviously, some changes here and there, not major changes in, in my eyes. But um, I think I, the the fact that I just knew the game and I was ready for the experience that I was going to get into, I think it made this experience so much better. Um, I hate the – and I'm using hate, but I, I really do – the idle scene kind of thing that they went for – I really dislike it a lot, but really? I think it works well for the game itself, for the story and everything. I mean, it, it works is well, it, but... Is it more of like a, you're just not really into, like, J-pop kind of, like, stuff at all, or... Just yeah, like exactly. I'm just, I'm just not into that kind of stuff. Like, I think it's cool. You know, like, I, I like music, I like J-pop music, or, you know, J-rock, whatever, but the whole, make a story around it, I just, I just thought it was odd. Not, not really odd, but, you know, not the... Not I, what I, would have I, for. I have never been more catered to in my life. Like, honestly, <laughs> the biggest thing for me to get over in terms of ever playing TMS is always I don't care about Fire Emblem. Like, all the Fire Emblem stuff literally does nothing for me. So, like, <laughs> the like I, lo- like, I love all the, like, battle mechanics and everything for it, and I'm already such, like, a super weeb of, like, I love that side of the industry. Like, I love especially how they cover all the different facets of idols. Like, it's not just them singing, it's them doing TV yeah. shows, it's them doing, like, model shoots. It's, like, the weird, quirky humor. And, and like, honestly, just, like, little things of, like, I forgot how much I had loved that game when I had replayed it uh, in January of just, like... It, it, it was one of those things of, like, why... It, it's kind of almost like the polar opposite. Like, in terms of, like, if you look at Switch ports... Look at Token Mirage Sessions, Sharp FE, Encore on Switch, and Catherine on Switch. And it's like, Catherine, because it had already been released, you're not going to have any of those moments of like, oh, look at all these quality of life changes. Whereas, yeah. like, Token Mirage Sessions doesn't really add a lot of gameplay. Like, it adds a new dungeon and it adds some new songs and cutscenes. But, like, what's so funny about it is, like, just those changes of, like, oh my god, the loading is so much faster. Everything looks better. Um the changes they did to like the battle mechanics and adding in new people and just making everything like everything about that game felt like so 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 much faster to the point of like okay the wii u version of that game literally can just go to a garbage fire it's like it, there is no yeah. reason to ever go back to it whereas like with like Catherine on switch it's like okay well 
I can play I can play it like this on like three other systems right now. I don't. It's not going to be like that dramatically better or different. Uh, it was like I I saw someone uh someone had a tweet recently about how they were excited about Catherine coming out, and they're like, mm-hmm. oh dude, it's gonna be so sweet. I can play Catherine on the go. And I'm like, I know the Vita version didn't come out, but like just because I like. Just because it exists, it always irks me that then people act like the Switch one is, like, Catherine Portable. I'm like, we've had Catherine Portable for, like, 15 months now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I feel the same way about it, too. Um, I think just Catherine was really poorly marketed in the West. It's been... Every time that it's been released, it's been just poorly marketed, I think. I cannot remember. Even the original release wasn't really that well marketed. Oh, the, the original was... actually did it did really, really well. Like, the original American release uh, sold actually more than the Japanese one, surprisingly. Yeah, and, and I like that a lot. I like that, that it really well. I just can't think of a time where Catherine wasn't marketed as weirdly as any other Persona game or any Shin Megami Tensei game. I don't know. The game itself is, is interesting enough, so I, I, I can't I can already imagine how to market that game. It's just so different from everything else they have. Yeah. Um, but kind of like wrapping up like my thoughts on TMS so far, like when I beat it, I was so enamored with it. Like if it wasn't for the fact that I was immediately going into... Um, Oh, at that point, I would have been playing, uh, going back to try and finish P5 for the first time, P5 mm-hmm. Vanilla. So if I didn't have that, my plan was I was going to completely, completely finish New Game Plus. I played probably half of New Game Plus on TMS just to check out the secret boss fights and stuff. Yeah. But, like, besides that, like, I was just, like, just because, like, I find so much enjoyment in that battle system, I was like, oh, I, I could have just, like, kept going, especially because all the new little things they add in New Game Plus have made it so fun. Like, uh, my biggest thing that I always find amazing no one else ever mentioned was when you beat the game, they added an encore that you can play, you can have any party member and you no longer have to have a Kutsuki anymore, which, like, makes it a whole lot more fun when you can actually swap him out. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I think it's really interesting. The battle system in that game is one of the best ones that Atlas has done for their RPGs. And it's so odd that people just don't want to look at it like that. Um, I don't know. The game just got so so poorly uh, shown the first time, I think. But I really like the battle system for this game. The whole... Um, what is that called? The mm. chain thing they do? Oh, I lost um, yeah, like with like, the battle, like with the attack chains of calling in everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that stuff because it's so... You can break the hell out of it if you like if you know the combos and everything it's just so fun uh combat is really addictive for that game okay I, ju- I could just myself just go go into the dungeons and just fight for hours yeah not i even, love that and, and not even the combat like the like the loop of like going in upgrading your weapons getting all the new skills getting another weapon like mastering all of those skills so you just like perfectly have everything like queued out it was really really fun and like one of the few things like i was surprised how much i enjoy playing that in portable mode like because sometimes i'll play my switch probably more docked than anything even though i perform perform like handhelds more than anything Mm -hmm. but uh yeah that 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 was one of those things i was kind of surprised how fun it was going through dungeons and experience things like even in handheld mode yeah i don't think i played a game at all in handheld mode uh maybe maybe a little bit but not a whole lot it's because i have to record gameplay for the channel and stuff Mm mm-hmm uh, so that's that's why I have to have it docked and everything. Although sometimes every once in a while I'm just like I want to play it on handheld, but <laughs> it's it's a good. I mean the Switch is in this really odd spot where handheld or docking and everything. It's a good experience. Was fl- frankly playing with this stupid controller. The, I don't know. I hate the uh, the Joy Cons on on the. Um, on the TV, I just I just don't like how they feel, and I'm I have a controller, but it just doesn't work well. I'm I'm in the like, I'm like the weirdo when it comes to talking about Switch stuff. So I love playing with like just two Joy-Con controllers and the little grip, so it, like looks yeah. like a dog face. And I hate the Pro controller. I think the Pro controllers are such trash. Like if it wasn't for the fact that Joy-Con drift is a thing, like I i really really just enjoy like playing either in the joy con grip or even just separated like i don't know i just feel like those controllers feel surprisingly really really nice to use but yeah like there there is no at least for, at least that i've ever come across there's no perfect just switch controller like i the fact that i probably used a gamecube controller as much as i have joy cons is probably not a good thing 
<laughs> right. I thought about buying one of those, but I don't. I don't play enough Smash to justify just buying another controller. Uh, maybe maybe at some point I will. It. I mean, it, I love the the GameCube controller. I think I spent the most time with that controller. What one of the one of the uh, few reasons why I do use a game controller a lot for certain games is uh I have my I have a Wave Bird, so it still works like perfectly perfectly fine. Is like a it's like one of the best like wireless controllers because it just uses like a little radio signal thing you hook up to, so there's mm-hmm. like absolutely no delay. It's like super super snappy. Did you see this guy that made the uh, the GameCube controllers uh, that were oh, adaptable like, like, for? Oh, yeah, detachable. It's like, here, yeah. Let, let let's let's make let's make the switch like 15 pounds heavier. <laughs> yeah, I saw that video. I was like, man, that is so cool. At the same time, like that is a lot of work for <laughs> for that particular thing. Uh, it looked really cool though. Although, like you said, it's super heavier. Probably not even worth the uh, carrying around. So, speaking of sad things that are heavy and probably not worth it in the end, I definitely didn't, but I think we have to at least give a bit of a shout-out to this uh, because we were shitting on Little Big Planet earlier. You more than me. Uh, do you remember <laughs> Dreams came out this year? Oh, you know what? I remember. I only remember because of these shitty Persona games somebody did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think like I saw the, there there was really one really good one, good in quotes at least, of a uh, Persona Five remade in Dreams, and it's just like one really terrible battle. Yeah, I, well, the one I was thinking about is like I think you play as Morgana, and you're just like walking around. Everybody just looks really odd. I don't know, it's just some random game. I'm not shitting on the game. Whoever, if you ever listened to this, I just thought it was really strange. I was like, it's like Persona on drugs, or I don't know, it just it was bizarre. But that's the only reason why I even know about Dreams. I I I, I didn't know about it. I mean, I, I heard about it, but it's not my kind of game. I, I'm not gonna play those kind of games. Yeah, it, I just more feel bad for Dreams than anything of, like, if you're looking for that kind of experience of, like, make your own kind of game, it's, like, ve- it's a very good tool from everything I've seen. It's just one of those things of, like, it came out way too late. Like, it's coming out in the last year before the PlayStation 5, and it's just, like, one of those things of, like, it was in early access for a year. I felt like no one in early access ever really cared about it besides the hardcore creators, and... There was just never that movement besides, oh, hey, look at this video on Twitter of someone playing something. Like, There was never that moment when someone was showing you something in Dreams where we were like, oh my god, I gotta play this. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the issue with that game is um, it allowed for people to do anything, and everything that people was doing was just clones of games. You know, Mario games and Sonic games and random clone of games it was hard to like have something original really stand out right yeah yeah i think i think that that's really what if what i would have done medium molecule right that's that's gonna be that game mm-hmm. right uh, i would have done this i would have obviously made dreams and then make a couple of actual games in dreams to kind of be like okay this is what you can do with dreams and like i know they, they did that but they didn't really do like oh yeah it's like they have one experience called art streams which is like from everyone i've heard who's played it, it's like oh yeah it's great but one experience isn't going to like sustain people in terms of like like say whether you liked a little big planet or not little big planet had a complete single player game even if you never wanted to make levels it had a full-on campaign with like tons of different worlds and levels yeah yeah you're right i um, I was shitting on a little bit planet, but it's not bad at all. It's just not my. It's just I don't like platformers a lot. I am bad at platformers. In fact, the first time that I played Mario, I clearly remember that because we went to an arcade, and they had Super Mario Tree on the arcade, and I spent fifteen bucks trying to beat like the first or second, um. Like not not even like story or what, what do you call that the level the yeah, second like, level, yeah, like a level or whatever world. Mm-hmm. yeah like I literally just I just couldn't I I'm just so bad at them <laughs> so I told my mom I was like I I want to get one of these because I was just so stubborn about playing that so I'm I'm not good at platformers at all so that's why I don't even review them because I'm I'm I can't play those games. <laughs> well, I have bad news for you because a game that you will be reviewing is going to have a lot of platforming in it. So back in February, Persona 5 Scramble came out in Japan, and uh, while I'm not sure how much of it you've really played, I kind of want to ask you something, because yeah. this has been picking my brain, and this is going to sound way more important than it actually is. 
<laughs> if you had the choice, you are Daddy Atlas, you have the lever, like one in each hand, do you actually change the name to Persona 5 Strikers in the West, or do you stick with Scramble? Uh, you know, that's a good question, because I have a lot of thoughts about the Scramble name. <laughs> <laughs> the first time that it was announced, I was so bummed out about the game because I don't like the um, Musa. It's gonna be really. Yeah, I don't like the Musa style games, and uh, the name Scramble sounds bad to me. So when when I saw the leaks about it being called Persona Five Strikers, I was like, hell yeah, I love that so much. To go ahead and change that. Why is that not even the name in Japan? That, that would, sounds like a like a much better name. Um, so yeah, I'll definitely change that name in the West. Like I know there's a lot of people that don't like that kind of stuff. Rings the bell to me of of uh, Lucifer's Call. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> just brings bad memories on that. End. But I think it's a good idea because it's it's much more marketable. You also have to think about marketing the game although at this point i think people you don't even have to worry about marketing everybody's waiting for that I, I, yeah i was gonna say like well considering <laughs> considering the game has uh, been out for at this point four plus months in japan and in asia for over a month i i think it's safe to say they haven't worried about marketing for a while oh yeah definitely uh no i'm in a weird boat of like so do you know why it's called scramble in japan I have no idea. But I would really like to know if you. So, so the whole point about it is like Shibuya Scramble in terms of like it's kind of like a, a pun in a weird way of like you kind of need to know that it's referring to the location of like Shibuya Scramble in terms of like lots of action and also bustling around and that's sort of to also kind of uh, give an idea of what the game plays like. So it's like a bit of a scramble and like a like a big tussle with all the enemies. So it's kind of a play on words, but I like it almost more than Strikers just because it kind of like – because it has part of the location in the name with Scramble, I like that because the I think if you hear a game like Persona 5 Scramble, you don't – sorry, like Persona 5 Strikers, you don't really get an idea of it like being uh, like an action road trip game. As like where a scramble like sounds more weird, but like I don't know. I I also sort of feel like there's almost like a bit of like genericness to the sound of the name of just like Persona Five Strikers. It's like okay, so is it a fighting game? Is it an actual RPG? Is it a bowling game? Like what is the Strikers? <laughs> yeah, you're you're right. I, I see that. I see what you mean. I just like the striking part better. I just think it sounds badass. That's all. It's just a personal preference kind of thing. I've been saying for years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as soon as I get someone on the record, my first question to Atlas is I need to find out who the guy who works there, or girl, who hates the word the. They gotta stop getting rid of the word the. The golden and the <laughs> royal are fine. That sounds normal. Uh, I don't know what I yeah. don't know who who hates the word the over there. Yeah, yeah. You know what? I want to know that too because it really bothered me when this when they took out the royal because. Honestly, it just sounds important. You know, Persona 5 the Royal. Hey. Persona 5 Royal just kind of sounds like, uh, okay. The, the, the main <laughs> one, uh, why it always triggers me is because the graphic designer in me gets a lot, really, really hurt. Because they only remove that part of the logo where the is, and they just leave that space empty. They never, like, fill in the space or make it kind of feel even. Like, it's especially bad with uh, P4G because it, like, there's, like, the golden is just kind of oddly off-centered to the left. Oh yeah, you're right. You you are totally right about that. Which I'm sure I'm I, I would bring that up and the person at Atlas would be like oh, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I feel like maybe they just care about like the is it grammarly correct? But I mean, who cares? It's yeah, a it, Japanese it, it, game. It's, it, it's hard to say because I mean, this is also a company who's published games like Caligula Effect and Dungeon Travelers 2. Like, they've released plenty of games with weird... Like, you can't tell me, like, The Royal is any more ridiculous than 13 Sentinels' I Guess Rim. Right. Uh, you know, it's really funny whenever that game... When I first, first saw that game, I was like, why Why does it have the title? <laughs> what does that mean? I keep just calling it 13 Sentinels for the longest time. And somebody goes, hey, have you heard about Aegis Stream? And I was like, what game is that? I have never heard of that game. And they started telling me about it. I was like, that's 13 Sentinels. <laughs> I completely removed the half of the name on, on that particular game for some reason. I just completely like it went out of my head. 
So there is a game that I always when people say, um, oh here it is, it's Igus of Earth. So whenever I hear uh, Igus Rim, I think of Igus of Earth, which is this Axis game. It's like a tower defense RPG that came out like on PS4, PS3, and Vita. It's one of those things of like I don't know why, but for whatever reason, like that's the game that always pops up into my head. So that's why I always have to refer it as uh, Thirteen Sentinels as well. I just I just don't know I don't know why I just removed. The, the second part of the title is just too long. It's like Tokyo Mirror Sessions. I, I'm i like, oh, that is that is too much to remember. Okay, so I'm going to give you three choices of games that are notable, but I have not touched at all, so I have nothing, sadly, to say about them. And all right. I'll, and I'll see if you do as well. Uh, so I'll give you a... You can either go on a long tangent or say pass. First up, Neo 2. All right. I love that game. I love... I love the um actually I did I even love reading this game? I don't think I had time to review this game. Um I think I did like a should you play kind of video on that. Um I love the Soulsborne type games. Mm-hmm. And uh th- frankly that was like my number three game on like waiting for that game. Um love the combat. Uh, they basically just did they, they did what a good sequel will do, where they just it's the same gameplay. They just added more stuff to it, and the, the stuff already worked good, so you don't really have to change a lot or anything. Um, you have your customizable character, so that's nice. You know, it just makes you feel more personable on that end. And the gameplay just is just fun. It's just good fun game. Um, wouldn't be like my game of the year. Like the other game wasn't either, but they are really good games. I like them. Yeah, the only reason I haven't picked it up yet is because I still need to go through the first one. But I really, really, really liked what I played of the first and second games beta. And by the way, just shout out to Koei Tecmo for especially with Neo. Like when they ran betas, like they've run multiple betas for both games. Like you can tell that they were actually listening. It wasn't like how a lot of companies will do a beta, but it's really just a demo. Like yeah. because like especially if you play played that very first beta or god i think it was even an alpha for um neo one that game was super different compared to what you got at launch it was very slow like they were they've always been really really receptive which is what i think helped make two so special because like you said it's not reinventing the wheel but it's just everything you liked from the first game just like honed and even better yeah, definitely. I, I really like that game. Yeah, again, it wouldn't be on my like my top games of the year or anything like that, but the experience was there, and I really liked it a lot. Well, I'm glad that I asked about Neo 2 now. The second one is Doom Eternal. Doom Eternal. I am not into shooters. I I play shooters, but I'm I'm just not. It's not in my in my in my game, so I'm gonna pass on that one. And Animal Crossing: New Horizons. Um, that game is really time consuming, so I actually passed on that one too. Although, a lot of my friends played that game. I feel like I almost played that game just by watching them play it. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm kind of in the same boat of like, I love Animal Crossing, but I've not, like, even with all the months of people just like gushing about the game, I've not had that moment of like, oh man, I'm really missing out. And I've been just telling myself, like, I'm gonna get Animal Crossing. When like my I know my uh, my girlfriend can just play, and I can just enjoy it through her, just because I'm like I know she would like this a whole bunch, but like I also don't. <laughs> I'm such a baby I wouldn't give her my Switch just to let her play this game for the rest of her life until we like live together. So that that that's kind of like where it's the point of like because originally I was like oh I'll just get her a Switch and then get her Animal Crossing and then do that, and then mm-hmm. we got to a point of like whereas you've noticed now is buying a Switch is absolutely impossible unless you want to like stock online, and then at the same point I'm like I. Like if you if I could if I really wanted a switch I could get one but because it's like it's to buy a second switch for someone who's not even me that passion's definitely not there. <laughs> no, I, I totally hear you there. I think I did the same thing with my ex girlfriend. I bought her a uh, 3DS. I think at the time Pokemon game was Sun and Moon. I think was coming out. And the whole idea was, well, I want to play Sun and Moon, but I don't have time for it, so you're going to play it for me, and I'll tell me what you think about it. <laughs> so I bought one of those 2DS, and I just gave it to her. I was like, okay, you play it, and you tell me what you think about it, because I really don't want to... Like, um, I have, like, a love-hate relationship with Pokemon. Like, as much as I love Pokemon, the formula, to me, as an RPG fan, is just really draining the fun out of the game. 
it's and we can... uh, it, it's it's definitely no Digimon. I'm I'm in the I'm I'm the weird outlier who likes Digimon way 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 more than Pokemon ever. Oh really? No, I I like Pokemon a lot, and I love Digimon too. The um the last two games they did were really good. Yeah, like uh, oh. I I was joking when Pokemon Unite got announced on Twitter recently. I was like, <laughs> man. I'm so glad that I like Digimon more than Pokemon. Otherwise, I feel like this news wouldn't be as funny and would just be more sad. Whereas, like, <laughs> as much of a joke as it is, like, I love that I look at these Vita games with uh, Cyber Sleuth 1 and 2, and I'm like, I look at those, I mean, I played them too, but it's like, I look at that and I compare it to a the first brand new console Pokemon experience with Sword and Shield, and I'm like, how does this Vita game look better than this Pokemon game? <laughs> You know that's that's part of the that's part of what I I'm thinking like yeah and you're just comparing two games that literally came out at the same time in like 1990 or whatever whenever they originally came out mm -hmm. these these two zeros competed for for power for years uh, obviously Pokemon just did better overall but um they have not had a, a major improvement sure you can have some graphical changes to the games and stuff but they're basically the same thing still and it, again you can compare it to the last digimon games uh and it's substantially so much different and i, I just let's be honest there the the storylines and the gameplay is just miles away from what pokemon has done in the last i don't know 10 years yeah you i mean j even just like comparing like we were doing with cyber Sleuth, it's like even if you don't like Digimon, I've recommended Cyber Sleuth, both of those games, to SMT fans, just because, like, that game is very, very, very much inspired by, by that, even though it is a monster-collecting game. Yeah, you're, you're completely 100% right. That's how, that's how, so high, how, what, how I see it, too. So, uh, also, just because I'm contractually obligated to mention this anytime I talk about Cyber Sleuth, uh, two little weird things people don't normally know. Uh, number one... If you can, play those games on Vita. Uh, I think it's, like, the best version to play it. And the reason I say that is because by some hilarious me meaning, uh, the PC and, to a lesser extent, the Switch version uh, actually run worse than the Vita copy. Just because of the way it was ported, just the, it's just really kind of, like, off and whatnot. <laughs> but, oh, man, that is funny. I actually did not know that. But what's sad about it is, and I don't even know how Namco in America did this... In, I think this is for North America, but I know it's definitely in Europe. Uh, the first Cyber Sleuth game got delisted on Vita. And it, basically what that means is the only way to play it now is if you import a physical copy or if you already had it downloaded. So that kind of makes it a bit, a bit more of a pain, but they are also on PS4, and those copies are way, way, way cheaper to get. Interesting. That is so odd. Yeah, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. oh, yes, our next big one we're going to talk about uh, is not Cooking Mama Cookstar, sadly. <laughs> not Modern Warfare 2 Campaign Remastered. Not Bubble Bobble 4 Friends. It's Persona 5 The Royal. <laughs> well, as also known in the West as Persona 5 Royal. Yes, very true. <laughs> those, uh, those definitely get kind of mixed up for it. So... You and I, and especially if anyone has just been on the internet, lots of Persona talk. Uh, lots and lots of everyone who played the game three years ago coming out. And I feel like there has been a lot of criticism like you couldn't do when you're trying to be more critical. But I feel like, similar to when Persona 5 came out, it's just like when this when everyone got their hands on this game, it just felt like a wave of just everyone being like, "Oh my god, that's the best game ever." <laughs> so so yeah. so for you though, Kuro, like, what was your sort of journey playing through Royal like? Uh, and I guess really in terms of it, like, what was your context for starting P5? So, um, I seen an odd spot because one, I played five, Persona Five to me, and I think we talked about this whenever we uh, we did the the podcast for Persona 5, but um, to me, I feel like I played Persona 5 for so long. I'm, I'm actually kind of exhausted at this point of, of the series, oh. of Persona 5. And uh, so I played Persona 5, Vanilla, right, when it came out, and then I played Persona 5 two more times, you know, just kind of tried to complete stuff and everything. Persona 5 Royal came out in Japan last year, in October. I played it. Then 
the game comes out again in, in America and I play it again. So we're talking about I played the game about five to six times at this point. So the hype for, I was no longer on the hype train when people are wearing the hype train. So I was kind of like, I mean, the game's good, but see, you see the game of the generation. A lot of people were like, this is the best RPG of the generation. I'm like, how many RPGs have you played this year or this uh, generation, which is not to say that I didn't love Persona 5 Rojo and a lot of the changes that they did. Um, because let's be honest, this game added some aspects that I just don't feel like Persona 5 will be even playable. Uh, because I couldn't go back to the life, the life improvements in this game were to me massive. Oh, yeah, uh, some like, of them were... like when I beat Vanilla. I was pretty close to a platinum, and I mean, I still am, but I mean, like, in my head, I was like, okay, after I do Royal, I'll probably wait a couple of weeks and then platinum P5, and then after, like, I, the more I've just played P5R, it's just been like, oh, God, going back to vanilla P5 is going to be really hard. <laughs> yeah, it's just, the changes, and I feel like that's why um, when people ask me if, like, Persona 5 Royal is worth it, I'm like, just the changes a lot in, in the way that they... You do the actual gameplay, and when it comes to either the battle system or, um, or the actual like everyday today situation, like it's just so different. So many of the changes just make it much better experience. And that's why I actually haven't gone back to like you said. I was trophy hunting too. I was literally trying to get that 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 trophy, and I was like, you know what? I'm I don't think I want to at this point. I'm I'm good. I got the other trophy for the other one, so uh, it makes me half okay about it. Um, but I definitely, you know, looking the the more I sit on having played Persona Five for the longer months, the more I feel like I am still a little bit salty that they didn't change anything from Vanilla when it comes to story details. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even gonna get into spoilers on this one, but I felt like what I wanted for Persona Five Royal was an uh, improvement on the story, not an add-on to the story. I don't know if that even makes sense. No, yeah, for sure. Because um, like that, that's why like one of the that that's why like one of the biggest things is like, man, I can talk all day about how much I love the new story, but at the same point, the new story is so good that it makes all of the original story of like it makes it incredibly frustrating because of all these little things they did that they could have added and changed to make it just as good as the new story but they looked at the cost and they said okay well let's just take an easy example okay well kasumi we can add her in the game and sprinkle her throughout the story like maruki and jose but if we make her a party member, now we have to redo all the animated cutscenes. Now we have to redo and add more voice acting. We have to add for extra instances. Like, these little touches that would have been super appreciated would have also been expensive, and they probably didn't really have that big of a budget in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, that, that I see it like that too, and I totally get it. You know, it's, they have to... I don't know if people forget this, but this is still fairly small company. And mm -hmm. sure, they have the backup from Sega, and I, I'm not exactly sure how how much Sega is willing to invest into Atlas because it's not, you know, Sega. <laughs> but um, sometimes, but I sometimes I wonder if Sega can even invest into Sega. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly my thing, right? So I personally, uh, I see, like, I totally understand, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, if you had just put a little bit more into kind of like, you can still even cut out some parts. There were some parts of the original game that kind of leave kind of like plot holes. And instead of just kind of like removing stuff uh, which I would have been fine if they just removed some stuff and just kind of maybe rearranged the order or whatever um so I'm I'm in the camp where I love the new stuff so much that I kind of like almost forget about the bad stuff but uh, it's still there yeah and and that's honestly one of the biggest reasons why like when I was doing my review like the, there's a reason I titled it like uh, royally flawed it's like it's so great but as soon as you start like shifting on like a digging a bit into the game in terms of actually like comparing it to the original and things that it does and especially doesn't do it, it like those blemishes just become a whole lot more apparent and stuff so what really sucks for me especially as someone who's uh, like covers this and is part of the community is seeing all of the 10 out of 10 reviews it was getting and all the praise and what really sucks is because i don't think that the praise isn't earned I feel like so many reviewers online and a lot of people who are playing the game, they weren't going into this game as like I'm review like I they weren't just talking about Persona 5 Royal as a whole product. They were 
they were acting like this is like everything Persona 5 and then some. Like there, it was only an additive experience. It was like, well, Persona 5's already a 9, so everything they added just makes it better, so it must be a 10. It wasn't mm-hmm. like, okay, they're like... The, like, obviously, yes, Persona 5 Royal in almost every conceivable way is better than Vanilla, but I don't think it's fair to, like, take this game that released three years after its original release and just act like, okay, it's just going to get more points on top of what it got three years ago. Yeah, I, I, I actually, it's really funny that you mentioned that because we talked about this on, on my channel when I, when we did the um, the podcast. I tried to go in and as, as a whole, like, what is Persona 5 Royal as a whole product and how does that compare to... Persona 4 Golden or Persona 3 Fest or whatever, you know, instead of going into, well, looking at um, apples and a bigger apple, you know, is, is, it, is it the same product or not? No, um, I actually it went down for me. Persona 5 Vanilla was a 10 out of 10. And at this game, I think it was a 9 out of 10. Uh, it went down a point because I really, really thought that they were going to fix things. But in a sense... They they just added stuff onto it, which is good. I mean, I, I like the stuff, but I really I really expected a different direction. Um, but the new stuff is great. I'll say that the new stuff is the ten out of ten. In the in the same in the same vein of everything, I have to ask: if you re-reviewed Persona Five in twenty twenty, do you think you would still give it a ten? Probably not. I think at that point I was like, uh, at that point in my life, I, w- I was just, ha- I just had the game per- came out at a perfect time for me. I was like dealing with stuff, and the game came out and it helped me a lot and everything. So it was like emotional uh, part to it. But um, at the same time, I had waited this game for what eight years? I think was it eight years? Um, let's see. So are we talking about from P four to P five? Yeah. We're talking about it, so they'd be from 2008 to 2016, so six years. Six Sorry, years? no, eight years. Jeez, eight I, don't, years. I, don't, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know how time works. <laughs> Not only do we go to, through that, but a lot of people don't even know this, but Persona 5 was almost canceled. It was delayed multiple times. It had a bunch of development issues. Like, I remember following the news closely, and when they announced that Sega was going to buy... I was, I was like, oh man, is this game canceled? Like, what's going to happen to Persona 5? The entire time that they were going bankrupt, I was like, uh, I mean, like, what's, what's going to happen to Persona 5? That was like my biggest thing. I know people don't know that, but behind the scenes, like, they were going through bankruptcy as they were making Persona 5. So it was like their last shot at making it. And they did a good job, but I was still kind of like so concerned that the game was never going to come out. And it would have been really bad if it didn't because... You know, history would have taken a different turn. What's like most uh, depressing is if uh, you go and look at some old interviews for Shin Megami Tensei 4. Th- before that game came out, uh, the team used to have a tradition of before every release going to the uh, prayer shrines and wishing luck onto the games. And SMT4 was the first game they'd never done that with. And that was the year that their parent company, Index Group, had uh, filed for bankruptcy. That's crazy. Yeah. So, that, that is so, so like the, their their superstition was like, oh my god, guys, we do we doomed it with SMT four like SMT four how it made Atlas bankrupt. <laughs> oh man, and and, um, and I'm so like a lot of people were really skeptical as far as like how how it was gonna turn out with Sega. I remember the scare because I was a little bit scared when when it was it was first uh, announced, and I was kind of the same camp. I was like, I mean, Sega hasn't 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 managed a lot of their properties right in the last you know so i didn't know how it was going to turn out but i think that they had a, a pretty good healthy uh, relationship so far um i mean looking at they they still kind of let us do their own thing and everything so uh, that remains to be seen we we haven't had a new game from us since then like a new 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 game yeah i was uh i was talking actually in our discord today about uh, at the very least, whether you think Atlas is for the better or worse after being bought by Sega and absorbed, they've definitely uh, stopped being as adventurous with publishing other titles, games, and whatnot. And, like, we were talking about in the Discord of, like, whether... I don't know how you feel about the games or whatnot, but for me personally, um, when Sega got when Sega bought and merged with Atlas USA, 
that side of them kind of died and thankfully lives on now through NAS America, who now publishes all these different games. Like, they're the ones that gave us Caligula on PS4 and Switch. They're the ones who are now continuing, like, supporting the Trails games, the Ease games, uh, all these different little, like, weird things. Like, obviously, they did Danganronpa, but just, like, they're not just kind of, like, one and done. Like, whereas, like, there are other companies to different varying degrees, like with Axis and Exceed, but like I feel like NAS just does so many different crazy kind of games and whatnot. Like even just stuff like Penny Punching Princess or The Lost Child, and st- like they have just such a weird and crazy like diversity of games they publish, which is what I used to really love about Atlas. It's like guys, the people who made Persona are also publishing stuff like 3D Dot Game Heroes or Demon Souls or like conception too like there's they were all over the place yeah you're right and uh, i am hoping that us continues to do that although the rebranding to persona i'm sorry to persona 2 atlas west kind of has me still very curious as far as like is there any actually internal changes that it's going to happen um so i'm, I'm curious how, how that's going to turn into anything at all i don't know I'm, I'm curious about it i don't know maybe you, you may know more than i do on that end Sadly, yeah, I don't think the publishing side of things are going to get any more adventurous than they already are. I mean, especially with how kind of slow and safe they've been with everything, when they go out of their comfort zone, it still feels safe in the end, like stuff like uh, Soccer Wars. It's like, even to skip ahead for a little bit, like, I don't know how you really felt about it, but Soccer Wars is like the definition of like a wet fart release. Like, that game came out, no one was excited for it, that game is now out, if you liked it, great, but guess what? Like... That that it's just one of those things of like, there were so many factors going into Soccer Wars' remake to kind of be against it, and unless you're like a diehard Soccer Wars fan who's just glad to have that series back, like that's that game and that releasing just did nothing for nobody. Yeah, you're right. Speaking of that, it reminds me a lot of uh, Catherine's, uh, which we were talking about earlier because it's, it's a very similar scenario. Kind of like I mean, it's it's cool that it's there, and I'm sure. That game has not been re-released for over the times, but um, yeah, I mean it's, it's cool. <laughs> I actually I've never been a Sakura Wars fan other than watching the anime maybe like 15 years ago. Yeah, and... they, they they don't really make it very easy considering we've only ever gotten now two in the West. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I guess trying to like wrap up at least. I mean, we're gonna get into P5 talk a little bit more, but. <sighs> In terms of in terms of royal, it, it was just yeah, such that hard note of like, for me, it's hard not to just sound like I'm being like a cynical ass when talking about it, cause like I think Sega Bits made a post, cause now, uh, depending on where you're looking, I think if you're looking at Metacritic, uh, it shows P5R is now higher than the last one, so it is now back up at the highest reviewed game of the year, and. It's, I just can't not, like, it just, like, rubs me the wrong way every time I see it, and I love that game. But it's just, like, so, <laughs> so weird to me that, like, this this will not be the game that defines 2020. Like, I don't care what anyone says. Like, there is no way in hell that P5R, come, come the end of 2020, is going to actually be, like, a major consensus game of the year. Are you listening to this, and are you screaming at me <laughs> that you love P5R? That's fine. It can be anyone's game of the year. I don't care. But, like, I think as, like, us as an industry and even as a community, like, I, I find I find so few people who are like, no, dude, this is the game. Like, it just seems so odd to me. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I totally agree with you because, I, I mean, I have a Persona channel, and I'm a huge Persona fan, and I am not thinking of Persona 5 as, uh, as my game of the year. Even when I had already played Persona 5 uh, Royal. Um, I was like, yeah, this is this is a good experience, and I th- I like it a lot. It's a good game, but I don't I don't know if it even deserves the score that it has right now, Metacritic. And I'm not again, I'm not saying that it's a bad game because I obviously love the game. I play it a lot, but I don't I don't know. I feel like, I feel conflicted about it too, just like you do. I I also do. I think it's it's in an odd spot. That's why I'm going to when P5S finally comes out this year. I'm going to just bully everyone into playing it and coming to terms that it being the better game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I kind of want to talk to you about that, but we may have to do a spoiler uh, talk about that game at some point because okay. I have I have some thoughts on the story in on that one. Uh, thoughts for Scramble? Yeah. 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 
Um, let's see. So, going up into the next big one is one we were talking about earlier. Resident Evil 3, which I feel like doesn't get talked about enough, but I know it was kind of like... It was a little more... De- I would say not a little more. It was a lot more divisive than 2 Remake. Like, when 2 Remake came out, everyone was just like, Oh my god, this is the best game ever. But, like, I don't know if it was just, like, peak... I'm stuck at home, it's quarantine time, but I loved my time with Resident Evil 3 Remake. Like, it was just so fun to blow through that campaign. Like, I loved Jill, I loved Nemesis, I freaking loved Carlos. Like, the guy who did the voice acting for Carlos Yeah. awesome. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, Resident Evil 3, to me, like, it almost sits, like, all the, almost at the highest of the list right now. Uh, one, I love Resident Evil. Uh, Resident Evil 3 is my least favorite Resident Evil game, but this one kind of just everything about it is just better than the original one. I don't know if you ever played the original one. Yeah, yeah, I, but, I, uh, I've played all of them. Yeah, like I, I agree. Like it felt to me like they, like I know that there's stuff missing from that original release, but mm-hmm. that experience as a whole, I felt like they trimmed the fat. I felt like everything in there had a really good pacing. Like just sitting, like I sat, down, like I beat that game within like two sittings for my first playthrough, and I immediately, oh really, and I just immediately wanted to get back. Well, don't make that sound like it's crazy, crazy short, but, like, mm-hmm. I, at that point in my life, I was literally being paid to not leave my house by my work, so it was like, okay, well, I got nothing else to do, so let's just marathon right <laughs> No, I, I get it. I, I was streaming that, so I had to take a couple of sittings to, to play that. Can I, my idea originally was do the same thing I did for Resident Evil 2, which is I'm just going to stay up all night and play it in one playthrough, which is what I did for RE2. Um, that brings me to a question I want to ask you. You probably have the same thing in mind already. Um, there is a question on length when it comes to this game, which is really funny because it is not any longer than Resident Evil 4, or shorter. Really. Well, so Resident Evil 4, it's definitely longer than... Sorry, Resident Evil 4 is definitely longer than 3. But I'm like, sorry, no, no, not 4, Resident Evil 2. Yes. Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil uh, 3. I was going to say, uh, Resident Evil 4, if anything, is like is like is probably <laughs> tied tied with 6 as being the longest. Although, no, uh, 6 is definitely uh, the longest. No, 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 I was thinking of Resident Evil 2 because, uh, like you were saying earlier, it was divisive in the sense that so many people praised Resident Evil 2 for what it did, mm-hmm. but nobody actually talked about the length of the game. But this time around, so many people I saw complain about how short the game was, but it's the same length. Like, I, I think I actually finished the Resident Evil 2, I finished it faster than Resident Evil 3. Uh, I think I did 6 hours on 3 and 5 on on 2. Yeah, there's there was a lot of little factors that went into that ex- as well. And, like, before I really even get into that, like, one of the big things people forget about Resident Evil games is, like, if you go to howlongtobeat.com, you're gonna see that most of these games you can beat within 5 to 10 hours. But, like, no one, like, the whole point of Resident Evil isn't to, like, speed run through it in a marathon session. It's like, no, like, your first playthrough is going to be your longest because you're just kind of experiencing everything. But then they're, like, all of the games for the most part, like, especially the mainline games, they have incentives. Like, they have reasons for you to keep going back, checking out new difficulties. Like, that's what I love about, especially um, what they started doing with 7, especially since they added it in 2 and 3 Remake. Of like how Madhouse difficulty makes it feel like you're playing a totally different game because they change up all these different little elements. Like they're meant to be replayed. Like that's why they're not crazy long because they're just like such high quality through everything in there. Whereas yeah. like, let's just go back to what I was saying before with uh, like you can have examples like Resident Evil 4 is a really really long campaign for that series, and even that one still has scenes that are like okay it kind of drags a little bit. Like, Resident Evil 4 is great, but it is definitely pretty long. Whereas then you go to, like, Resident Evil 6, where it has four full-on campaigns. And it's like, I love 6, but my god, like, no one sits down and marathons all four campaigns in 6. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I saw, actually, Resident Evil 6 is my least favorite Resident Evil game. Just didn't I didn't like a lot of the stuff that they did for that game. But uh, going back to 3, I think another reason why people expected it to be as, as long... Uh, as they probably thought it was going to be, is because of the open world syndrome. I think there's like a like a thing. Every time that somebody thinks of an of an open city, of an open world environment, they think of like hours and hours of exploration and everything like that. And I think that that kind of hurt the game in a sense because people were hoping that it was going to be something like that, although it was never told. Nobody ever said, hey, this is going to be an open world game. Or anything, but I think the whole thing of like, oh, we're gonna be in Raccoon City, in the city, you know, that means open world, or that means a long time, or something. 
And I felt like I saw people complain about that kind of stuff, and I was like, yeah, this is an op- op- open world game. It's never been open world. Yeah, uh, I, I will say at least I feel like a lot of the negative sentiment was definitely coming from fans who might have just been coming in from 2 or just were, like, looking at a lot of the reviews because, I, I don't know, like, just, like, a, out of it for me, like, I feel like 3 Remake did everything I needed to and I never once even touched the multiplayer. So, like, the value for me of even buying that game day one for $60 of just the single-player campaign alone justified it for me without even getting into the fact that it had a whole separate game's worth of multiplayer. Yeah, you're right. I actually never played the multiplayer either. I'm not into those games for multiplayer. So, it doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, so... I, I, I at least appreciate that, yeah, we're kind of in the same boat with uh, Resident Evil 3. Oh, yes, and but another reason I was going to say why 2, outside of nostalgia, gets a lot more of a pass in terms of its length is the fact that there are those multiple campaigns. There's Leon A, Claire B, or Claire A, Leon B, of, like, it makes it feel like there's four playthroughs, when in reality there's one playthrough, and it's just tiny little tweaks and differences for each side. Yeah, you're totally right. It is it's the same game. It actually bugged me so much when that happened, because you think that it's going to be different, but it really isn't, and that bugged the hell out of me. Because originally it does make a change, but this time around it really didn't. It's almost the same game. Yeah, I, I know that. I know that bugs like a lot of, especially like if you had played like the original, that does kind of like uh, annoy him more. But uh, yeah, it just I don't know. I, I think especially because like the tone of both of those are so different, I almost feel like they kind of complement each other more. Just of like I love how scary two feels, and I love that like action movie feel that three lands. Right, best part about like that is the action i love how action heavy the game is but it's still a horror game unlike resident evil 6 which is basically just action resident evil 3 has the whole um action set but horror at the same time i love it it's so good uh, Resident Evil 3, it's a yeah, it's definitely gonna be like up there in like my top ten by the end of the year, maybe even like top five. Just kinda depends on what else really comes out, but yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's one of those games where, like, I was really, really uh, enthusiastic when playing it and even looking back on it now. But it's not like one of those games where I feel like... It's not like one of those games, like, I feel like I could drag people into trying to play. You know, it's just kind of like, yeah. if you liked it, you liked it. If not, move on. Yeah, I, to- I totally agree with you. It's kind of like, almost like Neo, what we were talking about earlier. Uh, I'm kind of sitting on the same spot in these two. Like, you know, the one was good. Uh, the other one was good, but it wasn't like it's not gonna, you know. Yeah, I'm no, I don't think it's gonna hurt you if you don't play it. I think it'll be completely okay if you don't play the game. But I, I personally liked it. I thought it was really good. Well, if you didn't play Final Fantasy VII Remake, it's definitely going to hurt you if you don't play it. That is one of those games <laughs> that I will think might put you uh, in a coma if you don't play. What did you think of Final Fantasy VII Remake? I see it on a really interesting spot. You know, the last time that we talked. You had finished it. I hadn't finished it. Yeah, I was still kind of going through it and everything. So we never actually revisited this. So I feel in I feel in a really interesting spot where I, uh, you know, like I either love it in a lot of aspects, and I was like, this game did a lot for Final Fantasy VII in general, and I really t- thought it was really good. There are part of me that I hated some of the sports, so they kind of like integrated into it. I was like. I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like in my head, I always thought of the remake as an actual remake. Um, no spoilers or anything, but this is definitely marketed in a in a really weird kind of way. Where it's like, wait a minute, what are you doing here? See, but like that's what I love about it is like imagine if it was just a beat for beat remake of like they changed nothing, same gameplay, same story, just looked better. I feel like I wouldn't be as excited about the future of the series if it didn't do the risky changes it did. Like, when I fi- like by the time I rolled credits on Seven Remake, I was mm-hmm. like, "Oh my god, I have no idea what's going to happen," and I am so excited. And that's yeah, and that's a really really great feeling to have, especially mm-hmm. for something that A is marketed and sold as a remake, but B expe- like for someone like me who. Out of the PlayStation uh, 1 trilogy of Final Fantasy games, 
I easily, easily, easily play eight and nine over seven every time. Yeah. So yeah. it got me so excited. I l- mm-hmm. loved the music. My like this one is gonna be yes. really hard to beat. Soundtrack of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? I had the same thoughts on on that aspect. Uh, let's be honest. The the remake in a lot of aspects is how even if we're not if we're talking about actual remakes of actual games like this one sets the tone for like this is how a remake should be everything that that you liked about the original game was here but there's like all this implementation of some new stuff the combat itself was different which i loved i liked the combat a lot some people even arguing about whether this was a good combat or not but it gets to talk you know it, it definitely did a lot of, a lot of good stuff um I think my biggest gripe with the game itself was just particular plot devices. I have a, I have an issue with uh, Nomura, who who has the tendencies to make certain games specific kind of way. Um, thinking of Kingdom Hearts, I just I just don't like his way of storytelling. And I I the last four games that he's made, I just haven't been content with. Uh, whether it's Final Fantasy 15 or this one, 13, so was, uh, was Kingdom this, Hearts. So was this an outlier for you in terms of, like, was this, like, the first Nomura game in years that you played where you're like, wow, I actually liked this more than I didn't like it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because cause, um, Kingdom Hearts almost has, like, this all oh, this really bad story aspect to it what is just like Kingdom Hearts 3 I'm, I'm referring to has like this like really bad like pacing to the game this game didn't have pacing issues at all I thought that it, it just kept you going and everything and I liked a lot of the implementations a lot of the new stuff like the, the new character well not new characters but the old characters that they kind of like they, they gave them stuff to do they gave them stuff to say when when a certain point where, where spoilers happen and I was like oh my god like I actually care so much for these characters I don't want anything to happen happen to them and there's such little characters that like they actually don't play in any kind of way into the story in the original game uh but this time around i was like so attached to like jesse and uh wedge and you know like they're they're not important to the plot at all and they're actually like so little characters in the grand scheme of things but they give them such a big highlight on on like the first 10 hours of the game um you know the whole thing about going to jesse's house and like eating pizza or whatever i mean as soon as soon as i saw all 900 of uh, Wedge's cats. I was like, I love this game. I, I can't not love this game with all these cats. <laughs> and, it, and, that's, and that's it. Like the the character development in this game is superb. Like the character itself, just ten out of ten. I really like that stuff. The way that they introduce characters and just manage them and everything, it was really good. I I really like that aspect of the game. Um, probably not my game of the year, but I I liked it so far. I think uh, it's definitely like you said, it leaves you hanging and leaves you want to see how the series is going to turn out because now it's it's i don't know if it's spoilers to say this but it's, it's kind of a sequel yes. and yeah. it makes you really excited for that because i've never played a game like this before a game that kind of subverts the expectations on, on that sense um and square enix definitely took a risk on doing this they, they it could have easily flopped, and I think a lot of people still didn't like it, but the majority still was pretty content with what they got, and that's good. As someone who had to bite my tongue a lot while you were uh, saying how much you didn't like uh, Kingdom Hearts or Final Fantasy 15, I w- I have to say I'm very pleased because when I was when I finally beat this game. I was worried it was going to split the fan base as much as Kingdom Hearts 3 had. And it was, oh, one, yeah. and it was one of those things that just, like, <laughs> I, I, I'm i glad that while there are the vocal people out there who were not pleased with a lot of aspects, that, like, I feel like still there is still so much hype and adoration that came away from people beating that game. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that this was a good game, a really good release. I think they had a good a good time for, time for it they, they and, were like right on the edge of almost of like almost having to delay that again which would have really probably hurt them yeah it, it really would have because the, the original one uh the original time frame was what in what february or something like that no, was Mar- that the original third it was originally gonna yeah, come out, yeah yeah mm-hmm. and then it was delayed like a whole month or almost a whole month um, I was worried that it was going to be delayed again because the COVID was starting to kind of creep on on people and everything. Uh, but it was released again at a good time. Resident Evil, Persona 5, and Final Fantasy, they they just released at a perfect time where people had time to play the games. 
assuming your store was open. I felt so bad when I would see people online being like, my Persona 5 Collector's Edition has been in GameStop for five weeks and I can't get it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thankfully, at least for the most part, even though it's unfortunate how many places are uninformedly opening up and stuff, at the very least, I feel like we haven't heard as much trouble in terms of people picking up their games and whatnot nowadays yeah i think i think now things are kind of starting to reopen which wherever you sit on that front i think that um at least i haven't heard anybody kind of complain about it yeah i had i was the same i had a same issue for persona 5 rojo uh my copy was delayed by um by Amazon, and I was so upset about it. I was like, "Oh man, like I already, I already talked to everybody about uh, about streaming the game, and people are waiting for me to stream the game. I was gonna buy a digital copy, but uh, I, I got a friend to actually let me borrow his copy for like a day. <laughs> so uh, I even did his. I opened his copy of the game. Like I did an unboxing for it, and it was literally just my friend's copy that I opened up for the unboxing and everything. I was like, I'll give you my copy. You care you have it brand new and everything. He was like, I don't worry about it. I don't care. I was like, all right. But uh shout out to uh to him. He's he's been on the channel a couple times actually. I have, he just haven't been here in a while because of work stuff and everything. But um he's he's a good buddy. <laughs> gotta gotta appreciate the friends who help you out like that. Like I had uh Friend, friend of mine, Marcus, lives over in London, and he hooked me up with the Xenoblade Collector's Edition from there, like the one with the big vinyl and steelbook. And oh, nice. I paid for it to, because I couldn't have Nintendo ship it directly to me, so I basically had it shipped to him, and then he shipped it over to me, but mine arrived uh, a full day before his, and I was like, dude... Uh, just open mine and start playing it. Cause like, if I got a game a day early and you're that excited for it, it's like, like, listen, with shipping, I'm not going to get it for like another week. Just, just play my copy. Right. Yeah. It's not going to really hurt you any at that point. Mm -hmm. You're right. I regret not, uh, pre-ordering Xenoblade Chronicles. And I guess, I don't know if you're going to, Oh, is that the next game on the... See, now, that was such a perfect segue. Unfortunately, I have to give at least a bit of a shout-out because I don't think you're going to have that much to say about this, but I'm currently still playing through this, and I am really, really enjoying it. Uh, sh special shout-out to Otowari Romono, Pre Prelude to the Fallen. Uh, this is the first in a trilogy of visual novels. The second and third came out a couple of years back from Atlas. But this is a remake of a 2002 PC uh, doujinshi game. So, outside of the fact that it's got a whole lot less sex in it, it's a visual novel mixed with a strategy RPG. And I really, really, really like it. It's very slow. You can definitely tell it's like the start of a story. But it's really, really, really quality. I'm... I'm sad that it's digital only on Vita, but the fact that it came out at all and that NIS America actually put out the time to make this release happen. Because what really sucked is, like, the reason we got 2 and 3 and never 1 is because the game's OG PC release got ported to PSP and PS2 in Japan, but never came out in the West, and... 2 and 3 were finally basically ported to current systems, but the first one was so based on that original PC file that, like, pl putting them all next to each other, it would, it, it would be like going from Persona 1 to Persona 5 in terms of, like, how oh, wow. like how drastically different the graphics look. And not saying that the, like, graphics are, like, that amazing, but, like, it, it, it is a very, very uh, vast visual difference. So what they did is they used the engine from 2 and 3 and completely remade and added a whole bunch of new stuff to the first game. So basically the release order was 2, 3, 1, but I knew this ahead of time. So even though I've owned 2 and 3 forever, I've been waiting for this first one to happen just because I was like, it, it it is so story heavy even though it is an rpg it is very much so a visual novel first i just like had to like i, I was like i'll i'll wait i know it's going to take like 9000 years but i'm finally glad that i did just cuz experiencing it from the beginning makes like a big big difference i'm not sure how you personally are you very much into visual novels at all uh yeah i am um i don't play it as much as i had before uh, because again, we're talking about like the time uh, consuming and everything. And these games are just so fun. Um, I think my favorite series on these is the Steingates. Oh yeah, yeah, those are those are awesome. Yeah, those are really good. Um, and I just got from you know 
watching anime and stuff, I'm like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna get get into that. Which is kind of where I like Persona too, because he has that that aspect to it. Um, which, like it or not, is is part of the series at this point. So, I like that aspect of the of the series. I really, really want to check out because I've only experienced the original uh, Steins Gate. I've never watched the anime. I really oh. want to check out uh, Steins Gate Elite just to kind of compare because I've not heard a ton of people talk about that being like the be all end all. But I like the idea of how like are you aware of what Steins Gate Elite is? I do not. I'm not. I'm not aware. So Steins Gate Elite is all of the original game story but present but it's uh basically acted out like the anime so it looks like you're watching a visual novel version with like stills of the anime so like the lips and stuff still move there's oh, less animation but i see yeah so they basically they went and they took the studio who did all the animation for the steins gate anime and they mm. had them do all of the missing scenes that weren't in the anime from the game and they just made that all interactive that is pretty cool. I didn't know about that. I'm going to have to check it out. And it's on Switch? Yeah, it's on Switch, PS4, PC, and only in Japanese on Vita. Oh, wow. Why? Why is, did Sony just absolutely completely crush the Vita? Sadly, that that's <laughs> actually up to Spike Chunsoft, the publisher. They just yeah. they just never wanted to bring it over, which kind of is a bummer. But, yeah, I mean, th- there are multiple w- ways to check it out. But the only big difference is, and I think what m- keeps the fandom from talking about Elite is, like, the be-all, end-all, is if you've seen how the anime looks compared to the original art style, they're very, mm-hmm. very different. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those uh, things where actually a lot of a lot of visual novels do that, where you get something and then, um, man, what was I watching? I was watching something the other day. Uh, this is just entirely anime, by the way. Not no, uh, but there was this. Uh, <laughs> I was watching this anime called Real Life. I don't know if you've seen of it or heard yeah, of it. Yeah, there's a, like a there, there was a game announced at New Game Plus Expo, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so that is based on a visual novel. And I, I seen the visual novel before. I read it. So when I watched the anime, I was like, why does all the character look so different? And like it's just slightly off, you know, like the cheeks, the cheekbone structure or the face structure is different or whatever. I'm sure the artist is not the same person, but uh, it, it threw me off for like the first like five episodes until I got kind of got used to it. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it happens all the time in anime. I, I think you just you just can't have the same artist working on it all the time. I, I get it. Well, and especially with like certain art styles that are just so much harder to animate. It's like when you look at, uh, say, like take Danganronpa in terms of uh, it's like that is such a it owns its art style and its art is so unique but if you watch something like especially the first season of the anime or just look at like the manga it mm-hmm. loses so much of that luster when the production values kind of change yeah i mean speaking of that is we you can just look no further than persona mm-hmm. it, it just loses its and it's so funny because i mean you will think that that was happen but it just doesn't you know it's, uh the art is the art, and it is so weird to see like another artist do the anime for Persona, for example, and it's it's just it just something feels just off about it. Yeah, you, know, you can always kind of t- tell it like has its own little differentiators. Like even the P4 anime, which is a lot more widely regarded as popular than like P5, like that one almost kind of has a more muted look. Like, the colors feel a lot darker. Like, it it doesn't feel like you're playing the game, even though it has a lot of elements directly pulled from the game. Right, you're right. And that's funny that you talk about the muted, because Persona 5, the animation, has a muted color scheme the entirety of the time. It's just a little, of like, darker than the, the game, and it just feels so off. Especially when you see those red scenes where they're actually using the... the the color red and you're kind of like well what does it look so dark the anime is like it's a really bright red color on the game uh but the anime just kind of like doesn't do that i don't know i thought it it was really weird it's like such a meme but it's it's best compared when you look at the showtime attacks from like how the game presents it and then how the anime shows it off of like wow like this this (laughs) this is what this is what it like looks like when you're looking at a budget running out right here (laughs) you're so right and what stopped them from just grabbing the the animation from the other game i think i think for that one it's one of those things of the animation was done by oh my god studio 4c for p5r so they obviously the anime wasn't done by them i think it was 
A was it A one or someone? Yeah, it was A one, but A one has like twenty teams doing on things. That's what people don't realize whenever they talk about anime, because um, they always think A one does really good animation production. Yeah, when you're paying them money to do the animation, they'll they'll put their A team to work on it. When they're paying them crap, they're gonna use their B team or C team, and you can see the result with Persona Five. Yeah, my, my favorite thing is whenever you'll see, like, a big animation studio change. Like, uh, I feel like the last really big one was probably Attack on Titan, but um, I remember when One Punch Man, they announced that they were changing animations for the second season, and it, sh- it would just... It sucked. You would think that they, like, rebooted it by Disney Channel. Like, it just sucked all of the life out of that second <laughs> season. Like, it, it still had a lot oh, of the same man. people writing it and the same voice actors, but, like, just changing that little bit of, like, with the visual difference by the animation studios, like, the reception to the second season was easily, easily, easily worse than the first. Which, like, oh. it should have just been bigger than anything. <laughs> you know what? You're you're right on, on that. It's, uh, it's so crazy whenever you see animation groups just kind of changing mid-direction or even directors or whatever there was a, an anime that i've seen recently and you can just see this sudden change on tone on and everything just it just changes are you uh, uh are you an avatar or legend of Korra fan at all i am i am and speaking of that well recently just rewatched the uh the season because it was in, on netflix recently right uh so i just went through another run of of avatar so, do you know about um, the animation change that happened with Legend of Korra Season 2? Um, I know about it, but I don't know why it happened. I only know that it happened. So, wh- what's really funny is just because we were talking about this, and I, I love uh, all the little behind-the-scenes stuff for it. Legend of Korra, originally, if people don't remember, this it amazing to me, like, Legend of Korra started when I was graduating high school. That makes me feel so freaking old. Um... <laughs> Legend of Korra was supposed to be a spin-off series, like one like a one-shot little here's a couple episodes, there you go. But its reception for the first season was so crazy and so popular that Nickelodeon immediately was like, "Okay, start a second season right away. Start writing a whole bunch of episodes. We'll give you a bunch of new seasons." That's why like it's so crazy to like I always forget that Korra has more seasons than actual Avatar. And, oh yeah, you're right. And what happened was the creative process of if you notice all of season one for legend of Korra, every episode was either written and or directed by brian konitsko or mike i'm forgetting his other last name the two show creators yeah yeah. and mm-hmm. they were very 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 hands-on with every bit of the process of directing editing and like they, they just like they took their time with season one because they were like hey if you only have one chance at this just like make it count so right. because they had to just get the ball rolling with season two, three, and four, like they were making all three seasons at the same time, basically, they uh, got to a point where they were going to have to halfway through the episode, sorry, halfway through season two, they were going to have to change studios from Studio Murr, who has done all of Avatar, all of Korra, and they did Boondocks and a bunch of other shows. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome, awesome Korean studio. And they were halfway through the season going to have to change to Studio 4C. And what happened when they were changing through that, uh, what was so, so crazy, is in the middle of production, they had seen such a level of change before even anything had aired that they went back and rehired Studio Mer to redo all of those animations in their style because like, it was, it was like, that jarring for them. Like, And they are, there are still some scenes that you can probably tell uh, that are not by Studio Murr, but it's, just, it's one of those things of like, of uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think for it of uh, like like series that just like change and it just like really really like hurting development and stuff for it. So thankfully they at least caught that. And I don't know if, if you're in the boat of you, you think Core is better or Avatar is uh, better. But <laughs> one of those things is like man, I'm I I just love both series and I'm just like. I'm I'm just glad like they all had a good ending for both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I share the same camp. I don't I don't like compare them to the point where it's like, oh man, this one sucks or anything. Uh, I think they're both good. They're just very different. Uh, two, there one is more. Oh oh. By the way, different... I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, it was not Studio 4C. Um, it was Studio Parrot. So Studio Parrot did a lot of animation for stuff like Naruto and whatnot. 
Um, oh. Assuming I am correct here. See, so, yeah, I, I pulled it up to check myself because I did not uh, <laughs> I did not trust myself. So yeah, Studio Studio Parrot does. Yes, they they they've done like Naruto and they do not they do a whole bunch of other stuff. They did like Tokyo Ghoul. They they they're known for a lot more vaster but simpler uh, animation looking and stuff. So yeah, it was not 4C. It was Studio Parrot. Got it. Yeah, I think I seen on that camp where you know either way I'm I'm good with the the seasons. They're just different. They try to convey a different message, so I like them both in different kind of ways. Um, although I prefer the original Avatar to the next one, I'm I'm still good with both. But I have a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Because um, speaking of not liking, I'm liking a lot. <laughs> Going back to Scene of the Chronicles, which I completely forgot about that until now. That's all right. That that was the, that was our next thing we have to talk about. Because I know you're not crazy <laughs> crazy into it so far, right? Oh no, I am actually done with the game now, and he he really he really did a flip 180 on me in like the last like 20 hours of the game. Well, um, are we saying the last 20 hours of the game or the last uh like the new epilogue thing? Yeah, the last 20 hours of the game. Okay. Yeah, although I like the new new stuff, but it's not as good as the old By one. By the way, just, <laughs> the just for context, stuff. you are officially farther than me. I am. I'm like just now getting to, uh, oh my god, uh, I'm on the leg, so like I'm still in the planes and stuff. So oh I'm, wow, I'm, really? I'm, yeah, well, just because I've been trying to beat Utuai Romano, then Last of Us sucked up all my time, and I, I'm in no hurry to marathon through it. It's just going to be <laughs> like my like, hey, this is a fun game to play on Switch. So I think now I'll have a lot more time. For nice, it. Yeah, nice. Not uh, it yet. You played the original one though, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So. I, that was my first experience with Xenoblade Chronicles. I have a friend who is obsessed with the series. I mean, she, like, talks about it all the time, and she's like, you need to play these games, you need to play these games. And it was coming out on Switch, and um, I talked about it in my channel, and somebody was like, you need to play Xenoblade Chronicles. And I was like, all right, well, everybody's telling me I need to play the game, so I'm going to get it. And uh, I play it, and the first, like, two hours, I was like, mm, it's all right. I get to the fifth hour where the first kind of big thing happens. You know you know exactly what I'm talking about. Very big, yes. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, this game is not afraid to pull any punches. It will do what it needs to do to get you into the story. And I love that. Like, the first, like, five hours was like, holy crap, that was good. And uh, and obviously, it does the, the classic RPG. Now, what I like about this game is, this game does everything that a, that a regular RPG does. Like, it's so traditional as far as, like, a JRPG niche things. Like, everything everything in the checklist is there. You, you meet the different characters at different time, and you're traveling to the different areas. And, and all this different stuff that is just part of a JRPG. Like, it's so, it's so much of a JRPG that every time I was, like, thinking about it, I was like, this reminds me of, of uh, Final Fantasy so much. In like some aspects, it just it's immediately like pulled me to it. But the story is so good. I was I was very happy with um, with the story. I was, I was happy that I played this game. It may be my game of the year. I I have been I have loved 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 seeing how much people are like discovering this game for the first time and like exactly like commenting on what you're saying like. What's so great about, like, like because this is what I love comparing, like, it's been funny how many games I've compared Royal to this year, but it, it's been applied for so many things, but I love comparing, like, showing the re-release effort of Xenoblade compared to Persona 5, and it's, like, night and day. Like, look at how many new fans came to Xenoblade Chronicles being on Switch of just, like, wanting to check this game out, whether it be due to friends or smash brothers or whole many, almost so many different things whereas royal basically it catered to those fans who had already played it and were already going to play it to begin with like there was a very minor pool of people who were coming in for the first time but like this is exactly what you wanted like just like thousands of people gushing about this game the fandom getting more attention now people if they enjoy it like you you have stuff to look forward to like you can start playing x if you want you can buy two there's a whole the expansions for two like there's just so much really to like chew on for it it's like the perfect kind of thing of just like like right place right time i thought yeah. may was a really really good month for it yeah definitely i think that it came out of the perfect time like i had finished everything that i wanted to finish i could literally just sit down and, and sink my teeth into it and what is what was really funny when you were talking about um comparing it to persona 5 Rojo. Um, I literally played Persona 5 Rojo. I had like 
two weeks, so I was like, I, I can speed run Persona 3. You know, I can I can do it in like 60 hours. So that's what I did. I just I just uh, speed run uh, Persona 3, and then I get and I finished, and like the very next day or two days later, it comes out. So I was like, it's the perfect time for me just to sit down and play. My issue is that I was streaming this game. So nobody likes to watch grinding. And there's one thing about this game <laughs> is that this game can be grindy at times. And uh, I love the grind. I told you about this earlier. Like, I love the grind. That's, that's why I play JRPGs because the grind is there. And uh, that's kind of why I don't like about Persona as much that it's been considerably less grindy over time. Uh, although Persona 3 is, is grindy to a fault. But um, when you look at Persona 5 and just how easily it's for you to get to level 99, like way before you finish the game. And I'm like, yeah, kinda, it kind of sucks the fun out of, out of the game. Uh, so it was nice to just kind of sit down and, and just grind for hours. I was doing that off, off camera. I was just like, you know what? I don't mind grinding for a few hours. I will just I will always be over leveled. Like I, there was a point in the story that I was like level eighty and everything was like by, like level fifty or something <laughs> like that. I'm like I think I grinded too much. See, but uh, like it's so satisfying in Xenoblade, especially like for me. There's like two things that like never like I never never got sick of. One is just like obviously I could listen to that soundtrack on loop forever. Like that oh soundtrack God, yes. is just something else. Like if it wasn't for the fact that it was a soundtrack that's over ten years old, I would probably be gushing more about it being kind of up there with Final Fantasy 7. Like, Final Fantasy 7 mm-hmm. Remake, yes, it is using that score from the original game all those years ago, but it's doing yeah. so many more crazy things. But, like, the arrangements still, like, not to take anything away from Definitive Edition, like, all those arrangements in there are so, so, so great. But, like, on top of that, like, it is just, it was always so satisfying just filling out things, like, whether it be the Collectopedia or, like, the Affinity Chart, like, zooming out and seeing all that progress you've done and like being over leveled like it it never felt like you were cheating the game it felt like you were using the systems that were given to you oh yeah and yeah and you know a lot of people say that it that it has a bad combat like i have talked to a lot of people about this and i'm like no the combat is good you just have it's just specific you have to know how to put things at a certain time. And that's where grinding comes into play i think because a lot of people just want to go through the story or whatever and you sometimes it's okay for you to like sit down and figure out how the combat actually works, because um, I couldn't get it. Like the first twenty hours, was, I was so bad. I was like, I was dying, and I was like, I am hating this so much. The uh, the actual combat, I was like, it is it is giving me such a hard time. But uh, it's one of one of those times where it's it's giving you a hard time because you're not doing it right. Yeah, it's very similar. Did you ever play Final Fantasy twelve back in the day? I did, yeah. Yeah, so, like, remember when Final Fantasy XII came out, it was very rare for a game to play, like, an MMO if it was a single player. So, like, there are, like, players, like, have that hump of, like, you're looking at how it works because, like, you're not, you're, your difficulty doesn't come from pressing the buttons to do attacks. It comes from positioning yourself, knowing your hot, your, your hot bar, your cooldowns and everything. So, like, you're kind of, like, playing, like, a puzzle more than anything because I remember when I was uh, showing my girlfriend, like, I played, like, like, almost, like, the first five hours with her watching me and mm-hmm. like she really really liked it but the whole thing she just could not wrap her head around the combat even just watching it like just watching it for her is like so you're not really pressing anything you're just having to walk around it and like hit its butt a lot and it's like yeah but it's like it's one of those things of like i feel like xenoblade if you just <laughs> watch it looks more confusing than actually playing it yeah yeah i think so too but at the same time it's kind of like there are posi- positioning is important, right? But let, let's say that you play somebody like uh, the gunner. I forgot her name at this particular time. Uh, the gunner Starla? here. Yeah, Star- yeah, yeah. Charla? Is it Charla? Yeah, Charla. Yeah, yeah, Charla. She is such an interesting character to play because she has a cooldown on top of your cooldown. So you ha- you're doing your shooting and you're doing your healing, uh, and then her weapon will overheat over time and then you have to wait for that cooldown to cool off and she can't do anything until that cool off and uh for the longest time i couldn't get why she she wouldn't do a combo with everybody else you know when we're doing that link thing that, that they do mm-hmm. attack and sometimes she wouldn't show up and i'm like what is what's going on well she's she's cooling down you know so now not only you have to keep an eye on that you have to keep an eye on her and stuff so it was just kind of like messing with the different characters and stuff i mean this it has an interesting 
idea for me because a three party uh, game is usually not fun for me. I, I I want more party members in it, but I cannot think of a way to have four party members because I feel like that would be so broken. Yeah. Plus, in... plus I feel like this game almost like it to almost to a detriment. Like the cast is so great. Like you yeah. just want to you just want to play like as everybody all the time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you're know, right. I mean, even if he's somebody like Ricky, who is like a whatever, I don't even, I don't know what it is in, you know, it's just so weird, rabbit looking thing. I don't know. I, I like that so much. Such a funny character, but he's a, actually such a good healer. And like, he had like the best health in the game, too. So as soon as I got Ricky, I started playing with him. I was like, yeah, I love this character. And then I was like, well, what about Charlotte? Charlotte's my healer. So I kept switching around all the characters, just, you know, depending on the situation or whatever. Um, I really like the game. Uh, for uh, for the, my first experience of a Xenoblade Chronicles game, I'm definitely going to play the second one. I am on board with, with I'm in the fandom now. I don't, I hate, I hate saying that. But um, <laughs> I feel like, you know, it's like... <laughs> I like I never consider myself to be part of the of the Persona fandom, but like I'm in the forums and I'm in the Twitter like talking about Persona all the time and I'm like I am the fandom, but I I I hate that. <laughs> so so are you saying you're ready to join the uh, Xenoblade Chronicles network with me? That that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm on board with that. <laughs> oh my god! Just uh, just for the love of God, someone at Nintendo give Monolith Software enough money and please remake uh, Xenoblade Chronicles X and put it on Switch. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That will be good because I want to play that one too. I heard I heard uh, some things about that game, so X is I will be X is well. insane. It is more controversial. Like it's definitely like the most controversial in the whole series. But that game does stuff with its scope that I don't think the other ones do, which is a testament. Cause like, even when you're playing Xenoblade Chronicles definitive edition, like it, the, it has moments where you can tell it was a Wii game, of course, but God, mm. those environments are gorgeous. They're crazy huge. But like X is like, it, they like, they pretty much pushed the Wii U to its burning limit to run that thing. <laughs> like X is the only game that I can think of that has a option for installing data because like, that's how crazy big the world in load times would be if you didn't. Oh, wow. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I, I had a, I had a Wii U for some time, but it wasn't like I kept it forever. I think I had it for a couple of games and I was like, look, the Wii U just doesn't, isn't doing it for me. So I sold it. I think, uh, I regret selling it because I sold it with my copy of Tokimura sessions. And uh, yeah, and now and I saw them go up in price. I was like, man, I sold it for like fifteen bucks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, Xenoblade aside, oh, I guess actually, when you when you when you finally beat it, and with all with everything kind of is, so would you say Xenoblade is in like your top three of like games of the year? Yeah, definitely. Oh. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny because thinking about it, every almost everything that we talked about has been either a remaster, a remake, or s- both of them. <laughs> that you know what that that's very very true. Like, yeah, this this year has had like a lot of really really good stuff, but all the standouts have been either remakes or re-releases. Like I can't think of anything that I haven't played this year that hasn't been one of those or or a sequel. If we're talking about like Neo or uh, yeah. Yeah, not everything. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Yeah, the the first like original game I'm looking forward to this year is probably I guess going to be Ghost of Tsushima. That's yeah, like not same a, here. That's like not a sequel or anything. And even that one, I'm like, I I love and I trust Sucker Punch for everything. But like, because it has that new IP thing to it, you just never really know until you get your hands on it. Yeah. But before yeah. we get into that, we have to talk about the giant lesbian elephant in the room, <laughs> which is uh, the Last, of, the oh, last of Us Part Two. Which I just gotta, I have to just say this stupid little story. This is how big the Last of Us Two is in terms of it's like it has just destroyed the world in terms of talking about it, along with all the other horrible stuff going on. My dad called me a couple of days ago who follows nothing news-wise, but he read an article about The Last of Us because it had sold 4 million copies in three days. And his big takeaway from the whole article was this, is that it sold 4 million copies in three days, 
Angie played as a lesbian. Like that was just that was it's all he knows about the game. It's like, oh, it sold really well, and you play as a lesbian, I guess. It's <laughs> like you nailed it. That's the whole game. It's the oh, lesbians man. of that's, us. That's it. That's it. That's what you need to know about it. <laughs> oh my yeah. Oh, the first game. The first game you're just playing as Joel, trying to find a lesbian daughter, and then and then the second game you're now playing as her. <laughs> so. I don't know how your circle has really felt about it, but I I am a long, like, long-time Naughty Dog fan. Since Crash Bandicoot 1, through all of Jack, all of Uncharted, and Last of Us, I have just been super ride or die. I've never had one of their games really feel like a miss-miss to me. And it was just kind of held up. It's just like just something about like that studio with Naughty Dog has just like always been that perfect mixture of like it just everything I really want in the game at that time and just really just knocks out like really quality stuff. Mm. But with everything that was going on for The Last of Us Part Two, I don't think I've ever had more of a release where I was annoyed at the conversation happening before. Yeah. And also terrified of leaking, uh, like having the story leaked to me because of all the spoilers that were out there. So mm. I thankfully actually dodged all of them. I didn't know a single one. Me too. I, I didn't really know anything. I purposely told all my friends, cause th- this is what sucked too, is all of my friends who knew about it were like, well, I don't want to play the game anyway, so I'm going to dunk on it. Because the whole thing is like, it's now like the big joke, and it is still the same on Twitter, is even if you never plan on touching this game, it's just like everyone's dogpiling on to like make fun of the game, say it's trash, like talk about how like SJW garbage it is. And it, it, it was very frustrating before it happened because I was like, guys, the game's not even out yet. Like, just wait till you can, like, play it to yeah. make your own opinion. And then the more I played it, the more I got frustrated because I was like, where does the bad part come in? Like, I kept playing the game. I was like, this yeah. is a me. What, what? Where is the... <laughs> I was like, listen, I am I'm so not woke by all of this game. I need, I need some people to, like, tell me, like, like, what was so insulting about this. But... You know what? I, I, I agree 100% with you. And uh, I think I know what it is. And the reason is... And I, I don't know if you had something else to say, but I just kind of had to go right there and into it um the leaks were not a hundred percent right no that is exactly what I, that is exactly what i was gonna say because when i beat the game the first thing i did after crying like a big baby and oh man oh. not even t- <laughs> don't even cry me because i i cried in front of my mother about the game i was telling her about the game and i was like at the last moment I started crying like a baby. I didn't cry exactly when I play, finished the game, but when I was telling my sister and my mom about it, I was like, I started like breaking. I was like, man, this game broke me. <laughs> uh, but um, so so I gotta I have I have to say, just just because of uh oh you know but like I was saying though because of uh when I beat it with the leaks. I had to look it up once I finished it. I was like, what did everyone see that, like, made them think this is what was going to happen? And it yeah. was kind of hard because because so many of them had had to been taken up, posted down, like, fake ones, real ones. Like, what were the actual leaks that, like, came out from the servers of, like, the game? Because there was hours of footage before the game came out. Right, like, right, month. yeah. So when I saw everything, and we're not going to get into leaks or really get into spoilers at all, but, yeah, it's like you said, it's like, there were things from the game, but, like, because the context was missing, there were so many assumptions. Like, there were assumptions of, like, oh, blah, blah, blah dies in the end. Like, like mm-hmm. according to the leaks, like, the game would have been, like, half of the length and was just, like, super, super, like, terrible yeah, for yeah. it. Which was, like, I, as I was reading that, and especially now that I've been, like, listening to, like, spoiler casts and, like, seeing what people who worked on the game have been saying on Twitter... As, like, people who worked on that game, that's got to be so frustrating. Of, like, all of this stuff leaks from your game. Everyone is just shitting all over you. And it's like, what are you going to say? Are you going to, like, spoil the game and be like, no, dumb dumb, this happens in the game. You just see <laughs> it wrong. It's like, all you can do is just basically sit down, take it, and be the butt of everyone's joke. And yeah, yeah, that, that's the craziest thing about it. For example, a, a big thing that a, a lot of people was talking about was, and this is like, this is like a st- really stupid thing, but speaking of lesbians, they, everybody had the idea that, that Abby was a lesbian, and they thought that she was trying to kill... No, see, uh, the big one, I thought everyone everyone thought that Abby was a, was like a trans, uh, was a trans man. Yeah, yeah, he was a trans man, yeah, yeah, and, and she was mad at, like, uh, that, that Ellie killed her lover or whatever. That was 
legitimately. Oh my god, I know. When, it, when, I, when I found out that, thank god, the whole point of the story was not that Dina died, I was like, because oh, like, that was a big thing. Like Everyone was like, oh, please don't make the whole story just be, you killed my lesbian girlfriend, this is the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's the full thing about it is that, uh, like you were saying, like I was looking for the social mm, warrior stuff. I never saw it in the game. Like Other than the fact that um, Ellie is a lesbian. Which we already know, by the way, since the first game. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of it really even plays in remotely close to it at all. Like it's not, it's not a part of the story. Like sure, she dates Dane, uh, Dina, but it's not a plot point. It's not the big thing about the story. The story is not about her even being a lesbian. Yeah, like she's it, a lesbian, but that's that's part of her life from the previous game. Like she was the lesbian in the previous game too. Yeah, like it, like it comes up and even like, and this is also not a spoiler, but like there is there is a trans character in the game, and like that person in the game is like they have a very important role in the whole story, but like their story isn't just like oh, because they're trans, this is their whole character. Like, it, it goes into a lot deeper depths about it, and, like, there are so many awesome conversations that could be had about this, and it, it it's just kind of frustrating me that there have been two of, like, people shitting on the game who either are already never going to play or don't want to, and then at the same time, the other side of the conversation of people who have played it, and because of... One, there's one major thing that happens, and not even in the beginning, because I think if you just listen to people online, there's a major scene that uh, basically kicks off the whole plot in the first couple mm. hours of the game. And yeah, people, yeah. And like when people talk about it, they make it seem like within the opening credits, uh, this hat, this terrible thing happens, and it's like mm-hmm. you're playing the game for like over three hours or whatnot. Yeah, like, you, yeah. You fast... play, you play about five hours, I think, because yeah. I. So so yeah. so it, it it was just kind of sad of just like and I get it because it's such a even if you have it spoiled for you it is a mm. horrifying moment of like like just to show how terrible of a significant other I am uh when when I was done I had woken up uh my girlfriend <laughs> I'd woken her up and I went back and I replayed that whole chapter and showed her the very ending of it I was like look at how horrible this is she's like why would you redo like why would you show me this I was like, I was so, I was like so shook by it just because it was so, it right. was so just dramatic and like, it just all felt like so brutal. I just like felt like I needed to share it with somebody as like mean as yeah, that is. And, uh, and you know, a lot of people keep talking about how brutal this game is and it really is. It's like humanity at its worst. And it's like, if you even think of shows like The Walking Dead or other shows that do something similar to it, like this is. The Walking Dead doesn't hold its shoes into like all the stuff that happens in, in in this game. Like everything is just so bloody and and it's like it leaves you like this impact. Even when you're doing this random fighting and you're just fighting like random people, and you shoot, oh no, Michael or whatever. They see random shit like that. And I'm like, man, like I just killed Michael. I feel so bad that I killed Michael. Uh, you know, you know how they shout at each other, or like yeah, you kill yeah, somebody? or even like with like the pets and stuff. I, I'd be curious how you, uh, how how did you feel when you have if, if you've heard much of the criticism? Because one of the ones that that I never really felt was people feeling like the game is just trying to guilt you and to be like, oh, you did a bad thing. Do you feel bad? Like I never once while playing the game felt like the game was trying to like hit you with the shame stick it was oh, like no. like you can you can have that if you want like the names aren't there to make you feel bad the names are there to like just be like hey th- this is a real place these are people like a great example uh another one like without going into spoilers is the girl we saw at the state of play demo the girl playing the vita who you st- mm-hmm. like who ellie stabs and stuff like you see her later on in the story in a different context and yeah. that girl has a name. That girl, there's a reason she's playing her games. Like, she is known for playing that stuff. Like, right, right. It, it's just one of those things of, like, having context of, like, hey, if if you finding out that the Vita girl actually had a name and a life before that matters to you, great. The game's not going to bog you down for it. It's all optional. Like, the, yeah, the yeah. game's point isn't to, like, shame you into it. Because, like, while, yes, the point of the story is, like, about what violence and revenge does to people... I think the mm-hmm. gr- the greater conversation to have there, and it's a lot harder to obviously have this without spoiling it, but there's such a great conversation between what's happening, why the characters are doing it, and like how they feel about it. Like for me, one of the things I love the most was 
there's a character very, very early on, as we were talking about Abby, who you don't really know about, and Mm -hmm. uh, Ellie has a very large grudge against her. And there's a turning point in the middle of the game that pretty universally is very jarring, where you're like, I don't want this, why am I doing this, I want to go back to the main story. And at least for me, that turning point gave me such a crazy new perspective into that whole world Mm -hmm. of what was going on that I was like, wow. Yeah. I, like, on paper, it, it's just one of those things that, like, just goes back to my whole point of, you. Ha- like, if you want to actually have a more valid opinion on this game, I cannot recommend enough. Don't watch a video on YouTube. Don't look up the cliff notes. If you want to talk about this game, just play it. Like, don't mm-hmm. rush to conclusions. Don't feel like you need to dunk on it. I don't get mad at, like, the user score meme going around for it. Yeah, because guess yeah. what? Like, hey, anyone can go to Metacritic and review bomb anything. But it's just, like, one of those mm-hmm. things of, like, whether you love the game or hate the game or not, like it's not a zero. It's not even a four. Like at the very, mm-hmm. l- like the lowest I've like really heard someone say about it. And this is coming from someone who was very adamantly against how the game ended. He yeah. had so many negative things to say. And at the end of it, he was still like, it's at least a seven because like the gameplay is so great. The presentation is mm-hmm. stupid. I cannot get over how good the game looks. Yeah. You're right. The game looks really good. Uh, speaking of the story, like you were saying earlier, I think my only thing was um, – because I was thinking about it the other day. I was like, well, how could they make it so different so that maybe the impact will be different? And I feel like my response to that will be, what if they switched the stories around? What, what, what if you started playing as Abby for the first and saw like everything that is happening in Abby's life? Because in a sense, if you think about it – no spoilers again on this one – but we ruin her life. You playing as, as Ellie within like the first uh, 10 hours of the game, you're literally destroying everything about her life. And uh, and then you play as her, but you don't know that you're ruining her life. You just know that you're out for revenge because of what happened. But uh, when you're playing as Abby and you're seeing everything that what we done to her, it's kind of like, I wish that that had happened first. And then we have played Ellie. So that can we have like a the switch or uh, the switch moment at the end, and then you kind of know where everybody is coming from because we already know Ellie from the previous game. You know, like I we experienced her storyline. We know the attachment that she has to a lot of the characters in the story and everything, uh, but we don't know Abby. And so it was really hard for a lot of people to like I think like getting to Abby without kind of like hating her for what she does. But um, that will be my response. What do you think about that? Yeah, like I I have so many things especially based off like how the how much context by the end of the game you fully have like mm-hmm. what it's so funny of like all the emotions that the game takes me on like one of the, one of the craziest things without really getting into spoilers is like this game gave me so much anxiety. I feel like I now know what it's like to have a fear of heights. Like just <laughs> yeah. that whole segment with like going through the sky the bridge. bridge. The sky, oh, yeah, the sky yeah. bridge alone gave me like such nightmare feeling. Like I've never had a fear of heights or whatever. But just like the the way that they make everything in that game when you're playing is it yeah. feel like you're there is just like it's not just the violence that makes you feel like it's really there it's like it is the act of climbing up it is like those conversations when like you're talking about the cast there's like no one in that cast like even if it's a character that doesn't really get a lot of screen time mm-hmm. um like a like a tommy like or like a, well no 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 like even like the main like side cast of like a oh, tommy okay, cool. or like a or like a manny like those mm-hmm. few moments you have with them it's like I, I i've seen a few people talk about this tour like man i would just play a tommy game like just what some of the crazy dark stuff that tommy had to get up to while everything yeah, was going on definitely yeah. and like i loved jesse i was surprised at how much i really really cared for dina and ellie's relationship which Mm -hmm. which they do a very very good job of like letting you kind of have as much or as little as you have but like 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 even like my girlfriend who had seen like bits and pieces of the whole thing like there's a point at the end of the game where ellie has to make a choice and Mm -hmm. and my girlfriend was literally like yelling at the tv with me because you don't you you don't make any choices we're not like you don't make the choice yeah Yeah, she makes her own choice like like ellie ellie makes this choice and we're both just yelling at the tv she's like no stop don't go (laughs) jesus you know that was the biggest tease in that game anything else but that moment when when you're kind of you think it's over 
and you're just having you're watching them have this nice life that you know they can move on life goes on and everything i was like why is people hating on the ending like i was like i thought i think it's really wholesome and then she just makes her choice and i was like but why though <laughs> i know it, it like that, that that whole last section it's so funny it's like it, it's all not needed in, in terms of of a realism thing but at the same time you get it what you understand like for the most part at least for me like the game tries to make you understand fully mm-hmm. why all the characters are doing what they're doing by the end of everything it's like yeah are you going to agree with them no you're not supposed to because like i think yeah. people have such nostalgia glasses even for the first game like spoilers for the end of the first game mm-hmm. when joel kills the doctor and marlene and takes ellie away and basically ruins any hope that humanity has of having a cure like that wasn't your choice. You, you have to kill the doctor to finish the game. Like, he, the doctor will, like, basically cut you with a knife if you don't. Like, there's no way to get out without killing those two. And the reason behind that is, like, hey, Joel is a good person to Ellie in terms of, like, he is the fatherly figure she's probably always wanted in her life. But mm-hmm. even by his own standards, like he said, he's not a good person. He's been a hunter. He's been on both sides. He's done trade deals that are good and bad. It's like these characters aren't black and white. They're not meant to be like, oh, I'm, yeah. the, I'm the good guy, like, just because you're playing. Yeah, yeah. Them. So, mm-hmm. like, I think a lot of people kind of need to remember that going into it of, like, no one is no one is black or white. No one is just good or just evil. And also the game, I think even more so than the first one, nails that thing of every death matters so much, but mm-hmm. can happen in an instant. Like there are so many yeah. deaths in this game that literally made me scream because they're just so fast. Like holy it, crap, you're yeah. you're so right. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like especially... there's just, there are just like deaths that just happen where like if you blink you miss it and it's just like yeah on surface I, it's so on, quick like, on the surface you're like oh my god well like what like th- like because I've even seen people say oh well doesn't that just make their their death meaningless? It's like no because think about it think about all those people we were talking about that had mm-hmm. names like all those people and all those dogs and whatnot like whether it be scars or wolves of like those are real people and you snuff them out just as quickly with like a silenced pistol headshot as these characters do in the cutscenes. Yeah, you're you're totally right, and that I think that at that point you realize the impact they're going for is a completely different impact than just watching the character react to it because they don't even have a time to react to it. When some of these deaths happen, you don't have, the player doesn't have a, you don't, you can't react to it because it's like it just happened and they have to move on and like more stuff is going on and that is crazy. Also, I I would I would love to know what you just thought of like the overall gameplay changes they made from the original like. The, it's so funny guys we were talking about like how brutal and how horrifying the game can be mm-hmm. it is like it's kind of like in that like sadistic sort of way of like man it's really messed up some of the stuff you can do like whether it be like just like the violence and whatnot but god it is so satisfying of like sneaking around using those tools setting up traps like whether you want to be as loud, oh, yeah. loud or as violent like what did you think of the gameplay I love the gameplay. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people say that this is not good gameplay because they don't make good gameplay, but that's what I heard people complain about that. I love the gameplay. The versatility you have when it comes to the way that you want to approach things because you can say about choices and everything, but this game lets you do however you want to kill somebody in the most insane ways. You can literally shoot their legs out of if you want to do oh that. Oh my god, yes. You can <laughs> you can sneak and stab them on the face. You can stab them on the back. You can stab them on the front. You have so many different ways that you can actually kill them. Do you uh, do you have any like highlights of like moments in the gameplay that were just like super super horrifying? Because I have like two that like are etched into my brain oh, yeah. forever. Oh yeah, yeah. I have I have a bunch of them, but uh, there was there, there was this time where I I accidentally left one of the uh, one of the arrows that that explode unequipped on me, mm-hmm. but I didn't realize that. So there was this group of enemies that had just gathered together. They were like they had just started. They don't like the battle was about to begin, right? So I was just like, I mean, I'm just gonna shoot one to, to distract them, and I'll throw a bottle or something to kind of mess around with them and everything. Nope, I shoot it, it exploded, and I see their legs just like in the same spot. Their all, all their legs are together, so you kind of just fall off in a really random position, and you can't find like pieces of people or anything. That was the quickest battle, but also kind of like left an impact of like how much damage I did in that battle just from just throwing a single uh, thing. Like it's like, man, that is horrifying. 
Um, the other one was, I think I had a brick or a glass in my hand or something like that. And, uh, and I jumped, it did like a stab thing. And then I it just threw the, not didn't throw the, I hit, I hit them with the brick in their face. Uh, and then repeatedly started punching them on the wall and they couldn't even move. They were like trying to struggle or move. And I was just repeatedly punching them. And I was like, holy crap. It was like so graphic and I like it. That's the worst word. Yeah, it just, like, kind of, like, it, it does, like, that weird thing of, like, it's so satisfying just because of, like, how kind of grounded everything feels. Uh, so I have two standouts. One is, I'm actually, like, going to send you a picture of it. I have, uh, I had to take this just because, like, when I had done it, I was like, oh, I, I was, <laughs> I was, like, so, I was so shook by it. But at the same time, I had to, like, take a picture of, it, like, I had never seen this happen. So you can... You can get the uh, guns upgraded to the point of their damage is so much that, like, a shot will just take off a limb. Oh, yeah. Like you yeah, were yeah. mentioning. And this picture that I'm sending you right now, I shot this lady in. I normally had almost always gone for, like, headshots and stuff. But what happened was I had missed and she still died and I got her arm. And this oh, was like, And this was, like, the last person I had had in this big fight, and I just hear screaming. Like, so it's all done. Oh, but, like, yeah. this yeah. lady's dead, and she's just screaming out because I just shot her arm. So she's still mm-hmm. alive, but she's not going to do anything. So you just have yeah. to, like, hear these horrifying screams. And I walk up to her, and I'm like, what did <laughs> I do? And I just see this, like, just destroyed expression on her face, and her arm is, like, like right across from oh, her man. legs. Yeah, you know what? I noticed that too. Whenever you you take them down a certain really bad way, and they start screaming really loud, like if you shoot them with a shotgun or something, and like you gotta think about it, like being shot in the stomach front and center, like it's gotta really hurt. And these people like drop on the floor and start like rolling and screaming for their life, and you're like, oh my god, that is so crazy. And also it attracts zombies and stuff. They need it. It's like their own way of, of bringing things to you. Yeah, plus, too. like, I have one one other one, which I never got to happen again. Did you ever have someone beg for their life when fighting with you? Yes, yes. Yeah, so, like, I, I had that moment happen of, like, I was, I think I was with Jesse or something, and this lady was the last one. I had stolen her melee weapon in a fight, and everyone else had been dead around here. And before, the, it, it's like when it gives you that option of, like, do you want to, like, grab her or uh, kill her? She just gets on her knees, and she's like, please, just let me go, just let me go, just let me go. And I was so caught up in the moment with the adrenaline, I was mm-hmm. just like, no, I'm going to bash her brains in. So, like, I, I just crowbar her face off. And then once she's done, Jesse, like, says something, and he's like, Jesus, Ellie. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh my god, why did I do that? Like, this person could have just gone. Like, I'm sure nothing that terrible would have happened. But, like, the fact that, like, I, I I just did it with, like, an instinct and it gave me that moment. It, even going back to that, like, oh, feel bad thing. I didn't, like, I didn't, like, have remorse of because the, the game was guilting me. It just made me think. I was like, wow, this is really what her headspace must be like. Of, like, you get in that you get in that, like, kill or be killed mode of, like, th- that is why these people yeah. are acting this way. Oh yeah, yeah. I think I think in that sense the game does a good job at portraying that because it's not just about the violence. It's not about all that uh, because it, it really is more than that, and I like that a lot. Um, like you said, it's not the same as you're watching uh, a leak or where you're like watching the game just play out. Like experiencing the game does something so much different. So. Just before we kind of move on, because now we're, we're, we just slowly turned into uh, from Xenoblade podcast network <laughs> to uh, the Last of Us cast. Uh, do you have any major kind of gripes or any criticisms at all that uh, stuck out to you through your playthrough? Um, I do. I have a couple. Um, I think there is there is some stuff that I I don't I don't I need to think about it to kind of explain myself before I I don't think it's story issues uh, I think I have an issue more with the way the story was presented but also there's a pacing issue with the story like there's like it is uh, very, it is very long <laughs> it is a very long game uh, there's these things that they do with the flashbacks that I hated because they're not in order yeah for it, example it, the game likes doing its flashbacks and flashbacks and flashbacks so, for example, uh, at the beginning of the game, and this is, the, I mean, this is the very beginning of the game. Like, this literally starts with that. Joel is talking to Tommy, and he's telling him 
the the what he did in the previous game, right? And he and he says, "Oh, Ellie doesn't know," and you go with the idea that Ellie doesn't know, and then you get another flashback later, and she knows. But then you get another flashback, and she's finding out. And I'm like, "Wait, wait a minute! Wait, wait, what, what is what timeline is this?" Yeah, I I will say it, it felt kind of uneven for me, but I I gave it more of a passage in in that kind of moment of especially when you see that final flashback of the, like the main characters talking and there and that that was the moment that broke me without like really getting into it of like oh my god of just like there is one scene at the very very end of the game that gives just one little extra conversation of context for the opening of the game that just makes everything so heartbreaking cuz uh and, and this goes in this like cuz I don't know about you when I started the opening of the game it starts like after that little flashback you were talking about with Joel. There, it immediately starts after the E3 2018 uh, party party trailer. So yeah. Jesse is already talking to Ellie about kissing Dina, and I remember I was like, "Wait, so why not show the kiss? Like everyone saw the kiss in the marketing. Like what's what's yeah. the big deal?" But like by the time they finally show that after like 30 hours, it's like, "Wow, they were, like they didn't even show their hands like 2 years ago, but just like the way that they use that cutscene and adding a like one little extra bit followed up by some more for it. It's like, "Wow, like they they really thought it through. Like it, it's definitely not going to be a for everyone kind of thing because I know that uneven storytelling, especially when it comes to jumping all over the place in terms of time and place can kind of be all over it but uh, yeah for for me I, I definitely gave it a pass on that side yeah I, I couldn't because it I thought it was uh, it was distracting that's what it was I was more concerned I was like how am I following this storyline right now that is giving me nuts um, the same thing happens to Abby but Abby I get it because she's the new character so I didn't mind as much I feel like if we had started with a younger Ellie and you get all these things together to kind of build up to something, then you get your your moment of truth with the first five hours and you kind of see what's going on and everything, I would have been more okay with that. I still love the scenes. I loved whenever uh, you, just those dad-daughter moments that, that Ellie has with Joel and everything, they are so good. I, I love those little things that he does, like for her birthday and just little things that oh don't my, really yeah, I, I won't anything. even I won't even let you say any more about that. That mm. that whole scene, like just yeah, what, what, I'm, I'm not I'm not say, saying anything else. That yeah. whole scene is so great. Like that could have been its own little demo, and I'm like, oh my god, this is so great. Yeah, that that's the stuff that really builds up. I feel like they could have even used that before all that happened to really build up to that moment. Uh, which is kind of what I'm saying. Like I, I just feel like some of the the flashback were just placed in the wrong order. Um, overall, I feel like the game was good. Story was good. Um, the writing was pretty good. Uh, characters were amazing. I love the character writing in this game. They really make you care for characters that you know they're gonna die because you killed them, but you still kind of you still kind of hoping that you didn't. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, I know. Like there were there were characters. I'm like, wow. I like. I care about so many of these people I thought I really fucking wouldn't. And, like, unless you're Ashley Birch with Mel, I loved so many characters. But, yeah, sorry. No, no, nothing against Ashley Birch, but for whatever reason, her character in the game, Mel, I never had sympathy for. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And uh, it, it, yeah, it was, just, it was just that good. I liked that a lot. I don't think it's my game of the year, uh, but I, I think it's, it's close. If you had to put a number on it, what would you give it? You know, I refused to to give it a number on on my channel because uh, I didn't know what I was gonna give it. I think I'll probably give it a nine out of ten. I have it's, such it's little, a high I have such little minor things for it, but everything in terms of just like my experience of playing through it hit me on all of these like notes. It was, it was very similar to when I played Death Stranding last year. Of like, I know that like these games aren't perfect. But they mm -hmm. just gave me everything I wanted, and it just all felt like there was never like a moment of like, oh my god, why am I doing this? In which case, like I have friends who will be like, oh dude, like the section like was way too long, like why did you have to do this or whatever? And like I'll get it, but just for me personally, it just kind of hit every right little box, uh, almost like tailor made for me. So like this is like one of those rare ones of like, yeah, I'm I'd probably have to give this like a ten, which is like. Mm -hmm. but, so like for my for my context i told people i started this year with scramble is my game of the year it was like yeah. 
high eights if I had to. Final Fantasy VII uh, Remake, similar kind of score, but just it was such crazier in scope. Like I, I couldn't even compare the two. It was like yeah, like Final Fantasy one hands down. And then by playing the last, <laughs> then by playing the Last of Us, I'm like. The whole time I was playing, like, there's no... Like, this game is gonna have to actually slap me in the face for me to, like, not not love this. Like, even all the way up to the ending where it just had me guessing. So, like, it, mm-hmm. it, it just got everything I wanted of, like... I will be amazed if any other game this year does so much as, like, this game did for me. Which, uh... I'm just super glad it came out after all these years. It's crazy to think that... Last of Us 2 had more of a development time than something like Death Stranding. Like, how crazy long this was in development. But, I mean, when you play it, you can definitely tell. Yeah, definitely. I, th- I think it's one of those games that, again, like, yeah, we keep mentioning this over and over again, but this game was not meant to be experienced in a stream. You really have to experience that game for yourself to kind of get where they're coming from. Um, like, even if you knew the I feel like even if I knew the leaks, I would still feel the same way about the game. Um, just because it really explains everything to you. Where they're coming from and everything. Also, just a little bit of a uh, cool heads-up pro tip thing. If you have the game, I cannot recommend enough going into the main menu every now and then or after you beat it and check out all the concept art. The concept art is amazing. <laughs> like, they, they show off so much cool stuff and they had so many different kinds of concept artists. You get a really good idea of, like, where that game was going to go, even from little things like back when Joel had a girlfriend or how they wanted Dino or Ellie to look and all these different characters and, like, especially some of the, like, more brutal scenes, just, like, how they depicted everything was... Like, if you're just... A, if you're a fan of art, it's, like, one of the best, like, art art sections you can have without having an actual art book. Yeah, definitely. I like all that stuff. I like I liked all the unlocking things and everything with the game and everything as, as you progressed. Uh, there's just so much to look at. Actually, one thing that I want to mention before we kind of go from this game um there is so many accessibility features to this game oh that i like Lord. so much yes like any like it, it it feels like as long as you're able to like even hold half of a controller like this game is pretty much like has excel accessibility like things for you but what's so funny about this is like it's probably the most accessible game i've ever seen in my life Mm-hmm. but for such a horrifyingly brutal story it's like it's like not like oh hey this game this plat this fun platformer i've never got to experience like it's like if something like breath of the wild like look breath of the wild mm-hmm. is so like it's like something you could just give to anybody whereas like this game anybody could play it but it's definitely not a game for everybody to play <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, but this game does so much. Even little things like, for example, um, you can customize things like the the font. You know, like instead of finding that white thing, you can you can change the UI to blue or green or red or whatever. Like I saw somebody having like a pink one, and I was like, why is it pink? And I looked it up. It's because you can change the color of it. Um, and I thought it was like such a dumb thing, but sometimes I was like, I mean, maybe somebody that that can't really see white really well will need that feature or i mean there's so many things that that i just they just did for the game that i was like i mean that's really nice i I like that a lot the game got so many brownie points from my girlfriend when she saw that you could change the subtitle size you could change where they are you could change who's talking you could change the color because a big thing for her that i always give her a hard time about is she's one of those people who like like she she she's she was born here she perfectly knows english no problem but for whatever reason she just ha- she has an easier time digesting the story through subtitles and uh yeah the the fact that like it was like hey because like nothing is worse than when you need subtitles and they're like really really tiny really terrible like gray color and it like blends into the background so like yeah she she really really appreciated that and someone who like never really comments on stuff like that for her to notice it right away was like a, a big testament to it yeah i like that a lot too the subtitles is a big thing for me i need subtitles all the time even though i understand english and, and everything sometimes in the moment i just want to read to make sure that i didn't misunderstand what they said i blame i, bl- um, I blame her because she just watches too many like k-dramas and stuff i'm like so, <laughs> it's like she's so she's so accustomed to watching a show that needs subtitles and she's like what? you know it's it's part of the the dub versus stuff. Even when you're dub, you still need the subs. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Oh my gosh. Uh, so I think it's a little obvious uh, through the gush fest I've done that, yeah, as of now, Last of Us is my game of the year so far as we're at the halfway point of the year. But oh, honestly, nice. through everything we've talked about, though, Kurt, I can't, I, at this point, I can't even tell really what's going to be. So what is your current game of the year if you had to pick one and why? If I were had to pick one, it's probably going to be Xenoblade Chronicles. It just did a lot story-wise and everything. But I think the last of us like sitting so close to it that I'm kind of like, ah, man, are they fighting for it? Maybe. Um, and then we have scramble and, um, probably, um, reserving a spot there. Cause I don't think Virgil is even going to reach the, the, I mean, probably the top five, but it's probably not going to be, uh, on that spot yet. Um, but yeah, I think Xenoblade is, is good for now though. Although I'm going to play, uh, the last of us again, I want to do a, a new game plus and, and hopefully unlock everything that the game has to offer. Because there's a lot that I felt like I didn't go through. Um, although I did everything that I wanted to in the game, I feel like there's still a lot to do. Like all the upgrades and that kind of stuff. I love upgrading stuff in the game. It's yeah. just so fun. Oh, the animations, for example. I'm going to gush about it for a second. Every time... Somebody complained about that. I was like... I think it was like Jim Sterling or something. He was like, the animations for customizing. I was like, I love that. That was so good. Like, you have your handgun and he, she, you're like breaking it apart. And the different parts are... You know, like you're changing parts and adding new stuff to it. I was like, that is so cool. That is so nice. Even though it's a stupid animation just for... For um, customizing your weapon, you can see them cleaning it and everything. That's that is cool. I like that a lot. It's it, it gave all of us a new reason to enjoy ASMR, but for guns. <laughs> right, that is so weird, but you're right. <laughs> you're you're exactly right. Yeah. So, I think before we go into questions and wrap everything up, looking ahead, what is one game that either really piques your interest or do you think has a chance of? becoming your game of the year for everything that's uh, at least right now announced for 2020 in the fall all right uh so i think we kind of talked about this a little bit but uh er earlier before the the podcast started um cyberpunk 2077 looks like it's probably going to be the game of the year for a lot of people um but at the same time that could, that game could easily just flop and be the biggest disappointment of the year too and I think like that's one where I'm kind of like I sit alone on that and everything because everybody's just like 100% on board with it and everything. I'm like I'm on board with it, but no company is perfect. You know, things can happen. I mean, yeah, like people <laughs> people gush and love The Witcher 3 now, but I mean, if you remember when The Witcher 3 launched, especially on consoles, like that game was rough on consoles. Oh yeah, yeah, it was rough. It had a lot of issues. It needed a lot of patches for it to actually like even run properly, and let's not even begin that they, they had it had just stuff performance stuff that it was just not good. Um, so yeah, that, I, I don't I don't forget that, and I and especially because I'll, at this point I feel like they they're having development issues. I don't want to say it like that, but it is what it is. The game has been delayed four times already this year alone. Um, so. I just feel like everybody should be walking into it kind of like, it, this could easily not be your game of the year. And that would be okay too. Like, I know a lot of people that are looking forward to it. I am 100%. But if something happens to it and everything, I'll be okay with it being the way it comes out. Um, Ghost of Tsushima is the other game that I'm looking forward to. I, I'm probably looking forward to more than uh, Cyberpunk 2077. I love the Japanese aesthetic, the... Uh, the samurai fighting and everything everything that i've seen so far looks like it's gonna be a really fun game to play mm -hmm. um what was i gonna say so for my pick just because I could, I could pick like so many other little weird ones honestly looking ahead at the calendar the one that has me the most excited is going back to 13 sentinels just because i love vanillaware i i have so much faith in that team i've heard the story if you're willing to put in the time is really crazy but also really really interesting and really really out there so i would love for for me to go from like oh my god this billion dollar game was like my game of the year and then i play this uh 2d uh 80s mecha game and i'm like nope yep 13 <laughs> sentences is my game of the year like that oh, that would man. be that would be a really really cool moment um that that would just be like really like satisfying in terms of just like I I've always loved uh I've always loved like vanilla stuff like I don't know if any of their games yeah, have ever yeah. been like game of the year for me but like mm. just how much time I sink into all their games like even I yeah yeah you're right 
those games look amazing too. The artwork for for uh, the games that they do is just masterful. I don't even know how the games are not popular. Like I think their most popular game was definitely that um two D side scroller fighting you no know, game like RPG. Like what is it called? Oh my god, totally lost it. I said two D side scroller, but that's all they do. Uh, <laughs> what is it called? Uh, Dragon's Crown Man. or Owner's Dragon's Crown? Crown. Okay. Dragon's Crown. Yeah, I was like. They were both. I was thinking of both of them too at the same time. No, Dragon's Crown. Like that thing. That's well, that's probably the most popular game that they made so far. Um, with the reception being as as big as it was, quote unquote, quote, kind of thing. Um, I am I am looking forward to Thirty Sentinels, but I don't like the gameplay. I I seen so much gameplay of it because I was curious about that. It just doesn't seem like my kind of game. Like I will probably play it because of the stories. Because again, like you said. They make good stories. They make good games. But I'm not sure about the gameplay myself. If you're really, really curious and you don't want to wait, there is a Japanese demo you could check out. Yeah, I, I heard about that. I'd probably check it out at some point. Again, it's just the gameplay that I've seen enough that I'm kind of like a little turned off by the game. Uh, it's very systems heavy, yeah. Which, which yeah, it is. It is, yeah. Um, I feel like I want to talk a little bit about this, even though I feel like I'm dunking on Atlas in, in this episode too much. <laughs> but uh i feel like they did a really bad job of the marketing the game for the first game that they did because they announced they announced the game and they showed a character demo a character trailer instead of like a story trailer mm-hmm. and it's just so bizarre to me that, that was the trailer they did um because if, if you follow 13 sentiments like there's so many trailers that, that i was japan released and I just thought it was weird that they went for the character trailer because it just it doesn't tell you anything about the game or the story or anything. Yeah, that 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 whole that whole thing is almost a podcast and it's out of just like bewildering with questions. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of questions, we have actually a couple from Discord and Twitter. If you want to burn through these with me. Okay. All right. So our first question comes from the SMTN Discord. It is by Yowie Church. It says. Oh, my bad. Scrap that. This question is from Infinity Infinity and Beyond. It says, do you think Chie and Yosuke would make a good couple? Um, that, that is a good question. Um, I think so, but I I don't know. They're, I feel like they're more like the the friends that are like best friends, boy and girl kind of thing. They definitely have like uh, the brother the brother sister vibe. I actually I think, yeah, yeah. I think when I've when I last had Aaron Fitzgerald on this podcast, I think someone asked her that or the topic came up of like them being an item. And mm-hmm. I, I, I think that's just especially due to like the dynamic Aaron and uh uh Yuri have with each other, the English voice actors, like they definitely mm-hmm. give like that brother sister vibe. But like I mean for me, I, I gotta be I gotta be biased. Like if anyone's dating Yosuke, it's gotta be you. You and Yosuke are just, they are the definition of, like, yo, no homo, dot, 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 yeah. unless. Yeah, totally <laughs> unless you, homo. Unless you, unless you want to, man. I mean, I... Oh, man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't know. I feel different about it. I Like, I I, I see, I totally agree with that. Um, because it's different, because if you even compare it to something like Anne and Ryuji, which I totally cannot see them dating, like, I, I, like the, their, their relationship and everything. Uh, and I, I think that it's like way better than what because like you said it pretty much feels like a brother sister kind of relationship for so I, I wouldn't see it happening I don't I don't think so sorry if, if you were hoping for a different <laughs> answer <laughs> uh, so c- kind of similar LSD ask um, how do you, do you feel like the game by the end of it especially with games like Persona 4 Dancing All Night do you feel like the game kind of makes it look like you and Risa end up becoming a couple uh, kind of. I, I can't see that because, but I don't know, because Risa is always like that to you. Like, she's always kind of like sticking onto him. Even when you're dating another girl, she's still kind of there. Um, Like, for example, when, when you hang out with the other girls on the team and uh you talk about it, you know, like the one uh, festival that they have or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh you date Yukiko or uh, Chie. Uh, when we talk about it in front of Rise and and Yusuke and everybody, Rise kind of like gets mad if you hung out with the other two. Um, 
So it kind of made it almost canon that she likes you from the beginning of the game. Nothing against Rise, especially because, by the way, shout out to <laughs> Laura Bailey for mm-hmm. being, a, being a voice actor who can not only voice Rise, but also be Abby from The Last of Us, <laughs> who could not be any more different to Rise. Oh my god, so much of a different kind of... That is versatility <laughs> right there, yeah. Oh my god. Um, next question is... Let me see. Will you do the uh, Ari Force NG for Kami? Oh, sorry, we were, we were making uh, <laughs> making fun of NGPX. I think we've all made fun of NGPX too much. Uh, oh, str- dude, for sure. <laughs> strange, de- strange, strange Depression Redux says, do you think Atlas will be at the TGS online show later this fall? And if so, what do you think they'll bring? Um, I made a video on my channel about this. I think they will, but I don't know if Atlas is willing to do anything right now. Uh... <laughs> Um, yeah, I think they will. I think they will probably I mean, probably have something to show. Um, probably personal related. Uh, but that's my guess. I would love them if they have for Shin Megami Tensei 5, but let's be honest here, we're probably not going to hear about it again. Yeah, one of the reasons I've told people I definitely don't expect to see... Like, Atlas is probably, definitely, probably going to be there in attendance, but one of the factors keeping me away from thinking SMT5 is going to be there is Nintendo has a hand in the marketing and the news of SMT5, and Nintendo very famously is known for never being at TGS. They never, never, never mm-hmm. bring their stuff there. So there's no real point of them doing it at that event. They might do it around it, before or after, but yeah, yeah. proper SMT news will not be directly from the TGS online show unless something crazy happens with Nintendo. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the biggest bet is probably gonna be another spin-off from Persona. We still have yet to hear more about uh, Re Fantasy, which I'm sure they're probably gonna drop something because it was it was mentioned earlier this year when Sega put out this thing, this uh, crane game or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that you can earn there was a picture of Re Fantasy, so they're they're still kind of still working on it and everything. So. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear about that, especially because the the last um, interview that I saw about Sega and Atlas, Sega was kind of like, well, we want to focus on on new IPs, which obviously means Re Fantasy. I'm sure because Sega now has a bigger cake on on that particular game when it comes to the choices and everything. Um, so that will be my biggest bet, rather. Okay. Um, next question comes from Immortal Slasher, which is a little bit more biased towards me uh he says do you we think you will ever do an episode of the podcast with your significant other to which case i have tried before i tried a couple times i remember i was going to do one with her for valentine's day that kind of blew up in my face but i think there were other things going on at the time i i promise to at least get her on for one and at the very least i'm gonna force her to come on after scramble coming out in english i tried getting her to play scramble because she loves dynasty Mm -hmm. warrior games but it's still just a little bit too menu heavy for her to play without totally understanding it in english so once that's out in, in proper english i'll try and drag her on here to talk about it with me <laughs> yeah I, I can see that actually um when i had a significant other i did try to do something with her you make it but, you make uh, it sound like you're a widow you make it sound like she died and now you're just forever gonna be alone <laughs> <laughs> back when i was loved <laughs> no it's just it's just really recent so still kind of lingering in the air kind of thing oh, I, I know that uh, uh but yeah no i i tried to bring her on the channel a couple of times it's just she wasn't into games and she wasn't into anime so when i kind of like we finally sat down and like play the last of us she couldn't we couldn't get past like like episode two and i was like okay well don't worry about it then um but if i will do something i will have to accommodate for for like the other person too i don't know like you said something like uh valentine's date or something will be cool yeah well, what's so funny is like i've never been the type of guy who's like oh man i, I gotta date a girl who's as into games as me a that'd be very very hard to find without just dating myself and b <laughs> like i i just like i'll take whatever i can get and i just remember like when i first met uh when i first met mary one of the earlier things like we found out about with games is she grew up really liking dynasty warriors and never really got to play a lot of them so like she loves mm-hmm. playing dynasty warriors which is very infamous because all of my friends hate playing dynasty warriors with me so <laughs> like that was like an instant like oh yeah yeah she's a keeper she, she she likes dynasty warriors and will still play them with me it's like okay yeah i'm good now 
Nice. That was good, man. I, I'm happy for that. Actually, uh, besides gaming, I have like I know nothing about you. <laughs> then when it comes to, <laughs> I'm very deep. I'm, I'm a I'm a part time philanthropist. <laughs> We've got lots of deep factors behind me. Um. Oh, by the way, uh, Immortal Slasher also asks, when will the discussion for Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle ever be? It was going to be for the two-year anniversary, but I feel like the world was in such a negative place, it wasn't fair to just make an episode of us shitting on this game being two years old. Eventually, if I get the chance to play it all and like check out all the characters, I plan on going and doing a deep dive for it, but I feel like I would want someone who is very well-versed in it to kind of talk with me. I actually have a, a buddy of mine I'd love to bring on here, Patrick, who... Uh, listens to the show he's really really into cross tag battle so i thought it'd be fun to kind of have a dichotomy of someone who's played a lot and likes it and someone who's getting into it and is a little more negative <laughs> cross tag battle is a uh, an interesting game i bought it for four dollars so my opinions is biased i'm like it's worth four dollars <laughs> yeah yeah buy it at four dollars is good um i love the arena games a lot um and i feel like the cross tag battles just kind of went from from being this really intricate battle system to, I'm sorry, from Arena to that is so weird. Because Arena was a hard game. Like, it was not an easy fighting game. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you go from that to cross tag battle, and you're kind of like, wait, wait a minute, what's, what's going on here? Where's everything <laughs> plays like this? Uh, but I I mean, at $4, like I said, I, I can't complain about what I got for, for the value. I think I got all the DLC and everything too. So I'm, I'm $4 is a good price for the game. All right, so... We have from Strange Depression Redux says, oh my bad, not Strange. I'm my eyes are broken right now. Yao Church <laughs> says, who are the three best non-villain characters from Persona Four, and why are they not Yosuke, Kanji, and Naoto? I mean, that's those were my my, my <laughs> three. Games. They are the correct answer. They, you know, it's only it's only those three. It's like like yeah. they're 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 all they all like they all steal the show for so many different reasons. God, especially Kanji. Kanji is just yeah. so great. Yeah, Kanji is great. I, I see a lot of uh, which I probably don't want to get into too much about it. Uh, there's this whole, this whole thing about how, how he was handled in sexuality way and everything like that. But overall, like I felt like that character just wins you over because he, he goes from being this punk that is going to probably beat you up and take your lunch money or whatever to like this is like dumbass with a heart of gold that just like will sew you if you like if you probably like rape your shirt he'll probably fix it for you and be like <laughs> <laughs> you know like it's it just it's just such a weird thing like whenever you meet him you're kind of like that is such a well-written character. I thought he was a really well-written character, although some people want to argue about that. I'm, like, I don't, I'm not ready for that conversation yet. Well, <laughs> much a much, much easier conversation, thankfully, um, jub, 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 is from Twitter. We got asked by Alex Zero, and it says, what is your favorite video game soundtrack of the year so far? Oh, okay. Well, we talked about this earlier, right? Final Fantasy... Uh... Well, I seven. I had said seven is still my answer, but I mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you if you had picked seven over Xenoblade yet. Mm, no, I think I think definitely agree with you. I think I think Xenoblade has a really good music. I think the battle song is fantastic. It's just it's just hard not to jam out to it whenever you are fighting, uh, especially with the amount of fighting that you do in this game. Uh, it's funny when you never get tired of the song. Like I, every time that I'm that I was playing the game, I was like. I want the song to hit. In fact, when I was streaming, somebody asked me if I could play The Last Surprise. And I was like, from Persona 5, and I was like, I'll play The Last Surprise. But no. So I did it for like one battle. I was like, no, this just feels wrong. <laughs> we need to go back and play the soundtrack. That's what like the and one, because I... I've been going back and playing some Smash Ultimate with Min Min being out. The one <laughs> little thing that I was like thinking of after Definitive Edition came out, I'm like, God, I wish they added new music. Because there there's no new music from Smash... Uh, four. I mean, there's no mm. new Xenoblade songs. There's just like Xenoblade two songs. So it's like God. Like, even if they just like added like the arrangements from Definitive Edition, that would have been so great. Yeah, definitely. It will be cool, but I don't know if, if they will do that. I don't know. Nintendo is so Nintendo. So Nintendo weird. doesn't like to give us stuff for free. Oh, definitely not. I mean, they, they will charge you twenty dollars to buy a fifty-year-old game. So okay, Nintendo. We'll do it then. One more time. Uh, 
Ozzy <laughs> wrote in and said, what was your least favorite game of the last decade? Uh, I cannot begin to think of the games for the last decade, so I'm going to, let's limit it to this year to be a little bit easier. What oh. right now is, out of everything you've played, it stands out as like, oh, that was a bummer. I don't think I have played anything that was a bummer. Uh, like all the games that I have played so far will probably go in, in the list of really good games that I've played. Um, now what would be at the bottom of those list of great games? Like I'll let, I'll let you think because mine's a really quick one and a weird one. Because we were okay. talking about Doom. I've been doing a Doom playthrough for the whole series because I've never played a single Doom. So I played through Doom 1, 2, 64, and 3, and 3 broke me. Three is like if someone saw Half Life and said, "Let's make Doom Three Half Life, but worse." And I try <laughs> to beat it. So, like, I very, very rarely give up on games, but I gave up on Doom Three. Doom Three is just so boring. It is like no personality. Its concept is way cooler on paper than it is in execution. And even though it is remastered and is the best version of that game, it is just such a slog that I'm like. I, I almost wonder why they went through the effort of remastering it outside of it's the only game in the series one as well. But yeah, Doom <laughs> Doom Three I did not expect to be my worst game of the year so far, but definitely stands out as like one that I was like, no, fuck this game. Yeah, interesting. It's gonna be Pokemon. I don't know, Pokemon Sword and Shield came out last year, but uh you know the 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 DLC came out mm-hmm. and um First of all, I was not impressed about DLC. I, I hate that they did it. I, I I just dislike it, straight up dislike that. Especially if they come out with a, with a Sword and Shield 2 or whatever. And they have the guts to do that. Or like a, a Pokemon Gone or whatever they call the third game remaster. You know, how, you know what they do. And I, and I hate that. I'm like, man, you're going to do these, do DLC and do this. All, I don't know. I, I just, I'm just tired of the Pokemon uh, series at this point. Although being a huge Pokemon fan for the longest time, like that pains me with all my heart. Um, but I think that's probably the worst thing I played the, the DLC. And the DLC is not bad. It's good at content, and you get what you pay for, uh, which is one gripe that I have about DLC. When you buy DLC, it's just like it's not it's not worth the money you're putting into it. Uh, this one is definitely worth. I didn't even talk about about it on my channel because I was like I already bought it, so I'm gonna play it. But uh, I just hate that they did a DLC. They could have they could have made it for free. But you said Nintendo, so they're never gonna lose money. So. Um, kind of was talked about before, but I'd be curious if you had any more expanded thoughts. Uh, David Cass says, did the whole leak situation about the Last of Us Part Two, um, with the ending, turn you off at all, or change any of your opinions, or did it like shape anything of your playthrough? Um, other than getting mad at some people because they believe the rumors complete to be completely true i think that that was like my only thing i was like well this isn't what the leaks say you know like you know like it's it's different uh the context is there you know like no i'm sorry the con you know you have context but the idea of it was there but without context or without everything it's just kind of like particularly it didn't really affect me much because I, again i was like playing it and getting the leaks at the same time so it wasn't like i was leaked and then i played the game I guess that would have changed my experience, but it, but it, I don't think it would have. Okay, yeah, yeah. By some miracle, had dodged the leaks. I don't. I don't think I. Like, even if you're like interested in this game, you're like, oh, I'll wait for a little bit. I don't know. Like, it all just felt like such a minefield to me. I'm like, I can't imagine like. And I picked this game up on launch day. I'm like, I can't imagine if I like be like, oh, I'll wait till this fall and play it. I'll stay spoiler yeah. free then. Like, <laughs> like, nah, dude. Yeah, good luck with that. No, no. You can't even watch a trailer without being spoiled at this point because people are just commenting everywhere and blasting it everywhere. I saw a um, – there, there was like a – you know how Ellie – oh, I didn't even t- talk about this. There is You can play the guitar when, when you're wait, with Ellie and everything. Mm-hmm. And it's so accurately that people have been playing songs on YouTube. And um, I was I actually doing the same thing when I was streaming. I was just playing songs that I knew from guitar and everything. Uh, but I went to watch one the other day, and there were like people discussing spoilers there. And I was like, man, you cannot avoid spoilers if you're even remotely interested in the game. Thanks, internet, living up, living up to your reputation. Um, at Persona Forever says uh, he's he's gonna do rapid fire, so I'll let you take all of these because he he always is a uh, knocks them all out. First off, how are you doing today? Good. What were your reactions to P4G when it was announced for PC? 
Um, well, if I hadn't seen the leaks, I would have seen really, really excited. <laughs> I, th- I did a I did a reaction video. I'm, I'm using air quotes this time, by the way, if you can't see me. Um, and uh, somebody commented that is the worst reaction video I've seen. I'm like, because I'm being a hundred percent sarcastic. <laughs> I was like, well, if I tell you hadn't been leaked about it like three days prior, I would probably be crazy about it. Uh, but my original reaction was like pretty excited. You know, it wasn't like uh, I wasn't super crazy about it like other people because you and me have played this game several times. Mm-hmm. I have a beta. You're a big proponent of the beta. And I play the game plenty of times to then kind of like, I mean, I'm, I'm okay if the game didn't come out on PC, to be honest. I'm happy that it came out, and I'm happy a lot of people played it. I mean, I'm happy to play it again. But um, it wasn't like, like uh, let's say like they did the same thing for um, SMT3, Nocturne, who is, that's my favorite SMT game. And they suddenly decided to port it on PC. I'll probably go more crazy over that one. Okay, uh, why do you think Atlas decided to bring Catherine Full Body to Switch first instead of P3, 4, or 5? Because, I don't know, that's a good, really good question. I just think that it's just an easy port. It's a, it's a pretty small game. It runs on the beta. It, it probably had to put, like, not a lot of money into it. I'm, I'm 100% sure. I am, it's, it's a so, matter of I am so excited to... Like, cause I should have a code for like any day now, cause they asked for codes like last week for reviewing, yeah. and uh, I just honestly I want to go to the credits, cause I I'm I feel it in my gut that Atlas didn't make this port. It just seems so slapdash together with no frills, even for them. I'm like I feel like someone else had to have made this game. Yeah, for sure. I, I feel the same way too, and I don't know what, but like like I said earlier, I'm pretty sure it was just a matter of convenience for them, mm-hmm. uh, just like. Catherine on PC was a mere convenience for them. Uh, when do you think P5S is going to come out in the West? Uh, if, if you were me, I'll say probably uh, after September, so October, November, December. Um, do, 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 talking about this. Um, here we go. If successful, do you think uh, there will be a sequel to P5S? Yes. Uh, the director already said about wanting to do a sequel, so I think it w- he will definitely do a sequel if he can. And finally, he says, after all these P5 sequels or spinoffs, do you think At- do you want Atlas to make P6? Uh, well, he kind of phrases it a certain way, but I'm going to twist a little bit. If you had to pick, after all the spinoffs, are you more excited for a P6 or SMT5 at this point, after all the spinoffs are done? I think I'm ready for SMT5 more. Mm-hmm. It's just, I'm, I'm tired of... I said it on my on my video to yesterday, but I'm I'm a little bit on the burnout on on Persona. I think I played too many Persona games, not enough SMT. Uh, the last SMT game that I played was uh like actual new SMT. Uh, I think it was uh, Apocalypse. I think the last that's, that was the last one, right? Yeah, last proper, not uh, not including Strange Journey Redux. Right. Yeah, but I mean that was a remake of Strange Journey. Uh, but yeah, that was the last game that I played from SMT. So I'm ready for another one. Well, holy crap, that was it. Unfortunately, <laughs> my guess of this show being an hour did not work out very well. So uh, <laughs> apologies. I told, you, I told you three hours. I knew it. <laughs> Apo- apologies for the show going up late, but uh, to make up for it, you guys get three three hours of uh, whatever the hell this was. So, uh, Curl, <laughs> thank you so much for coming on and uh, putting up with uh, the world's longest five-minute break in the middle of the show that hopefully no one will hear. <laughs> you know what? That's totally fine. Uh, I knew it was going to come out to about three hours. I told you that i was like I have a that, that was with about me about cutting out many opinions on things as well that that's the scary part <laughs> yeah i mean and then we went on on a tangent uh f- a few times but you know that's how these podcasts are it's, it's usually the best part of the podcast we i know you, about... you think we're going to talk about this last was the longest and then i decided to talk about the legend of core for five minutes <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah that's true that, that was that was great though great five minutes right there so uh Kuro, where can people find you online and your channel and uh, all the places they can stalk you uh so you guys can find me uh the minute channel in youtube and uh at kuro kase 57 on uh twitter and you can send me a message or whatever i don't know i'm, I'm pretty free so um that's cool if you guys follow me or something no only fans uh, my only thing. <laughs> uh, I had somebody uh, send me a meme and he said only Flan. You know, you know, Flan is. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so it's it's literally just a picture of well, well, not a picture, it's a Facebook page, and it's just pictures of flans. Like that's all they have, only flans. And I thought it was the most hilarious thing I've seen in a while, and I love it. Every time that somebody tells me only flans, the only thing I can think of is flan now. Oh my god. Uh, uh, well, besides that, all the links will be for in the description of the YouTube video or show notes of the download. If anyone is curious to follow you. Uh, if you guys want, you can follow me. My personal Twitter account is at Torchwood4SP. The podcast Twitter is at SMT Network. If you'd like, you can join the Discord by following the link below. There's also a Facebook group. You can go to facebook.com slash group slash SMT Network. You can also find the Facebook page there where I normally just do the individual post that I do in the group if you don't want to actually join the group and just want to follow things. Uh, check out the channel just by searching either Spencer Presley or Shin Megami Tensei Network. It should pop up like that. I actually just hit 800 subscribers, which is so sad, but oh my god, hey, at least I hit 800 subscribers eventually. Hey, man, <laughs> that, that is good. And you grew your channel grew in like the last month just from that alone. Yeah, it's, not, it, when... it's been really funny because like I've always just used my YouTube channel as like a dumping ground since like 2008, and I haven't ever deleted anything because I have no shame. And <laughs> it's been so funny of like my one of my goals was like get to 500 by p5r and then now everything else has just been like all right well let's just steamroll into 1k and see what hor- horrible and embarrassing act i can do <laughs> you know that was that was my thing too i was like if i can get 1k by the end of the year i wasn't even thinking about 1k because i had like they got like 500 at the at the beginning of the year or something like that, and I was like, I was I wasn't really looking to like get a lot or whatever. And then I celebrated 700 subscribers, and I was like, you know, I could be okay if like I get maybe another hundred in like a few months or whatever. And within like a month, I reach a thousand subscribers, and I was like, what is going on right now? Why are people subscribing? Because <laughs> uh, I had a channel for like a year and a half already, and the first hundred subscribers were like impossible. I was like, I wasn't even concerned about that point. I was like, eh, if I get 100 subscribers, but you know, the year is good too. And then it's just the channel has been going on like this now. So it's good. It's fun. I mean, the last 200 people that subscribed for a channel, I was like, I did not expect that. Because I, I reached 1,000 within days. I went to 100 and like 1,100 and changed. And I was like, wow. Well, shout outs to anyone listening to this who's actually subscribed to both of us. You're extra special for them. Yeah, you guys are super awesome. It, I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of people commenting on the thing that I'm like, oh, I've seen them comment on my videos and stuff. So that is cool. Right. We have a good community. All right, Carl, you now have the difficult task of telling everyone goodbye. In whatever, All right. What, how do you end? How do you end your videos or podcasts? Like, what do you What do you normally do? Do you have a, do you have a sign off? I have a sign off. I just say I'll see you guys next time. Well, there you go. Bye, everybody. Yeah.